Part 1 Dunquin to Tokyo Chapter 1 A Flight to Russia I was born in 1942, the eldest of five brothers. My parents met in the 30s at the University of Oklahoma, where both belonged to academic honor societies. During the war, my father served as an artillery officer in Germany. After the war, he joined his brother in running a factory in Demopolis, Alabama, a state in which my people had lived since the early 19th century. With the birth of so many boys, my mother, an only child, was rapidly in over her head. She made us competitive and full of hijinks. The five of us learned to drive from our father, who taught us to push to make happen whatever it was we wanted to do. From him, we learned how to work hard. My entrepreneurial efforts started early. I had my first job at the age of five, picking up bottles at baseball games. In 1948, I won the concession to sell soft drinks and peanuts at Little League games. At a time when it was a lot of money, my father gravely loaned his six-year-old son $100 to buy a peanut parcher, a startup loan that put me in business. Five years later, after taking out profits along the way, I paid off my startup loan and had $100 in the bank. I felt rich. I still have the parcher. Never know when such a dandy way of making money might come in handy. With this $100, the investment team of Rogers and Sons sprang into action. We ventured into the countryside and together purchased calves, which were increasing in value at a furious rate. We would pay a farmer to fatten them and sell them for a huge profit the following year. Little did we know that we were buying at the top. In fact, only twenty years later, on reading one of my first commodity chart books, did I understand what had happened. My father and I had been swept into the commodities boom engendered by the Korean War. Our investment in beef was wiped out in the post-war price collapse. I did well in our isolated little high school, finishing at the top of my class. I won a scholarship to Yale, which thrilled and terrified me. How would I ever compete with students from fancy northeastern prep schools? When I went to Yale, my parents couldn't take me up to New Haven. It was too far. So on that first Sunday, when all college students are supposed to call home, I got on the phone and told the operator I wanted to call Demopolis, Alabama. She said, Okay, what's your phone number? I said, Five. She said, Five what? Just five. She said, You mean five 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 five? No, I said politely. Just five. She said, Boy, are you in college? Yes, ma'am. She blazed. I don't have to take this from you, college boy. Finally, persuaded I meant no disrespect, she gave it a try. This was back in the days when the Connecticut operator had to get the Atlanta operator, who had to get the Birmingham operator, who finally got the Demopolis operator on the phone. My Connecticut operator spoke first. I've got a boy on the line who says he's trying to reach phone number five in Demopolis, Alabama. Without missing a beat, the Demopolis operator said, Oh, they're not home now. They're at church. The New Haven operator was stunned, speechless. As my college years sped by, I considered medical school, law school, and business school. I loved learning things, always have, and I certainly wanted to continue to do so. In the summer of 1964, I happened to go to work for Dominic and Dominic, where I fell in love with Wall Street. I had always wanted to know as much about current affairs as I could, and I was astounded that on the street someone would pay me for figuring out that a revolution in Chile would drive up the price of copper. Besides, I was poor and wanted money in a hurry, and it was clear there was plenty of money there. At Yale, I was a coxswain on the crew, and toward the end of my four years I was lucky enough to win an academic scholarship to Oxford, where I attended Balliol College and studied politics, philosophy, and economics. I became the first person from Demopolis, Alabama, to ever cox the Oxford-Cambridge boat race on the Thames. I began to use some of what I had learned in my summer job on Wall Street, investing my scholarship dollars before I had to turn them into the Balliol Bursar. After Oxford, I went into the Army for a couple of years, where I invested the post-commander's money for him. 
Because of the bull market, I made him a tidy return. I came back to New York and went to work on Wall Street. I eventually became the junior partner in a two-man offshore hedge fund, which is a sophisticated fund of foreign investors that both buys and sells short stocks, commodities, currencies, and bonds located anywhere in the world. I worked ceaselessly, making myself master as much as possible of the worldwide flow of capital, goods, raw materials, and information. I came into the market with $600 in 1968 and left it in 1980 with millions. There had been costs, however. I had had two short marriages to women who couldn't understand my passion for hard work, something my brothers and I had inherited from our father. I couldn't see the need for a new sofa when I could put the money to work for us in the market. I was convinced, and I still am, that every dollar a young man saves, properly invested, will return him twenty over the course of his life. In 1980, I retired at the ripe old age of 37 to pursue another career and to have some time to think. Working on Wall Street was too demanding to allow reflection. Besides, I had a dream. In addition to wanting another career in a different field, I wanted to ride my motorcycle around the entire planet. I'd always wanted to see the world once I realized Demopolis, Alabama really wasn't the center of the Western world. My long-time lust for adventure probably came from the same source. But I saw such a trip not only as an adventure, but also as a way of continuing the education I had been engaged in all throughout my life, truly understanding the world, coming to know it as it really is. I would see it from the ground up so that I would really know the planet on which I walked. When I take a big trip, like a three-month drive across China, Pakistan, and India, the best way to go is by motorcycle. You see sights and smell the countryside in a way you can't from inside the box of a car. You're right out there in it, a part of it. You feel it, see it, taste it, hear it, and smell it all. It's total freedom. For most travelers, the journey is a means to an end. When you go by bike, the travel is an end in itself. You ride through places you've never been, experience it all, meet new people, have an adventure. Things don't get much better than this. I wanted a long, long trip, one that would wipe the slate clean for me. I still read the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, and I wanted to wean myself away from the investment business. I wanted a change of life, a watershed, something that would mark a new beginning for the rest of my life. I didn't know what I would do when I got back, but I wanted it to be different. I figured a 65,000-mile ride around the world ought to be watershed enough. In 1980, it was difficult to circle the planet. You couldn't get anywhere. There were 25 to 30 wars going on, and the communists wouldn't let you pass through Russia or China. If I were going to go around the world, it was going to be like everything I do. I was going to do it to excess, or not at all. My dream was to cross six continents completely, east to west across China, east to west across Siberia, from the top of Africa to the Horn, across Australia's vast desert, and from the bottom tip of Argentina right up to Alaska. In 1984 and 1986, I went to China to approach officials about crossing the country. I even rented a motorcycle, a little 250cc Honda, and drove around Fujian province to see what I could learn. Fujian wasn't all that big, maybe the size of Louisiana, but with 26 million inhabitants, it had almost seven times Louisiana's population. I drove and flew to several provincial capitals and put 2,000 miles on that bike as research. Then, at last, in 1988, I drove clear across China on my own bike. Back in New York, I went to see the Russians, as I'd often done before. Russia was still the big stumbling block to a drive around the world. I wrote letters and got others to write testimonials on my behalf. I hit an absolute stone wall. I'd go down to Intourist, and Ivan Kalanin, the director, would tell me it wasn't even conceivable. There's nothing out there in Siberia, he'd say, except bears and tigers and jungle and forest. Nobody goes there. Nobody wants to go there. And in fact, all the people the Russians sent there had wanted to come back. 
To my astonishment, no Russian I'd met had ever been to Siberia, or knew anyone who had. No Soviet citizen seemed to have a clue as to what was in his equivalent of our 19th century Wild West, just as most New Yorkers today know nothing about Alaska. Take the train, the Russians told me, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, or fly. Only a fool or a madman would drive. I finagled a proper introduction to the Russian ambassador in Washington, but even he was no help. I was slowly getting the point. Siberia wasn't like driving across the United States, one boring freeway after another. It would be different. Maybe they were right. Maybe there wasn't much in the way of roads. But you couldn't drive around the world without going through Siberia, and if I were to fulfill my dream, I'd have to find a way across. The maps told me that Siberia was 7,000 miles wide, about twice the width of the United States. As far as anybody knew, it had fewer than 20 million people, about the size of New York State's population, but nobody knew for sure because no one had ever gone there and counted noses. I figured it was no wilder than northern Canada and Alaska, which would be fine with me. In a desperate moment, I took a videotape of my trip to China to Ivan, the in-tourist official, hoping it would show him that I was serious. He smiled wearily as he took it, but he actually watched it. The next time I came, he said, there is one group you could write. He didn't know the English name of it, but he looked up the group in his official handbook. He found that he couldn't translate the group's name, so he just wrote it down in Russian, along with the address and everything else. It seemed to be an esoteric group called Sovintersport. I took the paper home, Xeroxed it, and pasted it on an envelope containing a letter in English, stating that I wanted to drive my motorcycle from the Pacific Ocean to Moscow and on to Poland. I'd said I'd meet any conditions the group wanted to impose, stay wherever they wanted, take any escort they needed to send along, even soldiers, I didn't care. I had to go. Whenever I looked at a globe, Russia's huge landmass jumped out at me. If I didn't go across Russia, I couldn't tell myself I had actually gone around the world, and if I didn't go around the world, it wasn't the trip I wanted to take. I didn't have much hope. Over the years, I'd sent out twenty letters like this one. Months later, after I'd forgotten about sending the letter, an answer arrived. It said, Dear Mr. Rogers, yes, you can drive across Russia. When would you like to go? Three or four lines, two paragraphs, and a Mr. Valery Sungarov was saying yes. I couldn't believe it. It was as if I'd been sitting outside a door, knocking on it every day for nine years, and it never opened. And then one day the damn door did open, and a guy said, Oh, come on in. How could he have known I'd been standing there for nine years? I promptly flew over to Russia to meet the people who'd said yes. I kept asking Oksana, the translator, Do these guys mean this? And she would reply, Yes, what's the matter with you? Is this really going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen. Why are you so perplexed and curious and disbelieving and questioning? So Wintersport was a Russian sports group that sponsored one-of-a-kind international sporting events. I'd been beating up on the diplomatic and tourist channels, and here were these Russians who considered long-distance motorcycle riding a sport. Lesson number one in going around the world? Know enough about the culture you're entering so you can maneuver in it. Otherwise, you'll get locked out. I was elated, still a little disbelieving. Could you really trust the Russians? Would one hand know what the other had agreed to? I might arrive at the border and be turned away. But this might be my only chance. This trip was something I desperately wanted to do. I was going around the world. Full of excitement, I flew back to New York in December of 1989, planning to set off the following March. Chapter 2 New York How'd you like to go around the world? I asked Tabitha, my companion over the past few years. They said yes? she asked. She'd traveled with me across Pakistan and India the year before, two saddlebags and one bike, 5,000 miles, and she'd loved it. I want to leave in March, that's four months, I said. Are you game? Africa, the Sahara, Siberia, across the Andes, 
and this time you can go to China too. What about my job, she said. It was a job she loved, administering the grants for a small foundation, a great job for someone not long out of college. Quit it, I said. This is a once-in-a-lifetime trip. I loved the way she ran her hand through her long blonde hair, scrunched up her face, and cocked her head to think. How can we carry enough stuff, she asked. Some of these places will need parts, gas, extra tires. She was right. I'd driven BMW motorcycles for the past twenty years. Being hopeless mechanically, I wanted the bike that needed the fewest repairs. Still, when I looked at the worldwide list of BMW repair shops, it didn't include Zaire, or Siberia, or China, stretches of thousands of miles along the world's worst roads. The ideal would be to take two bikes, I said. But I don't know how to drive a bike, she said. Maybe you could learn. There's a motorcycle school in Queens. She winced, not answering. She loved riding with me as a passenger. The Motorcycle Association said 90% of their riders were men, but that was changing. There were even a couple of magazines now devoted to women's motorcycle riding. At 23, Tabitha was as adventuresome as any woman I'd known. Now in my mid-forties, I would have 20 years of motorcycle driving experience to draw on. Tabitha would have her youth. If something happens to one bike, I went on, the trip won't be over. You take the driving lessons, and we'll both sign up for the BMW mechanics course, so if we break down in the middle of the jungle, we can fix the bikes. While I had sometimes spied her in the background as she was growing up, I first really met Tabitha Estabrook when her mother, Biffy, an old friend, dragged her over to my house, so I, who taught finance at the business school at Columbia University, could tell her it was in her best interest to go to business school. She was a tall, leggy blonde who had grown up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where, at the all-female Nightingale Bamford School on the East Side, she had absorbed the fashionable political ideas of her time and place, that in an enlightened society the state would fix almost all of society's problems. The Republican Party was an enemy of decency, a temple to greed, possibly the great Satan himself. Her father had been a Navy pilot after college, and now he was practicing law. As a schoolgirl, caught in the middle of her parents' bitter and nasty divorce, she found Nightingale Bamford to be a surrogate parent at an important time, and she continued to have great affection for her alma mater. At Amherst, she fashioned her own major, an interdisciplinary course featuring Islamic studies. At that first meeting, we were attracted to each other. Even though I taught at the business school, I told her what I tell all my students that she shouldn't go to business school, that it was a waste of time. Including opportunity costs, it would cost her or her parents more than a hundred thousand dollars, money better spent starting a business, which would succeed or fail, either of which would teach her more about business than would sitting in a classroom for two or three years listening to learned professors who had never run a business prate on about doing so. I asked her out. One thing led to another and we began to see a lot of each other. We kept discussing the trip over the next few days, and she began to plan as if she were going. It was natural for me to take her along. I had made many long-distance trips, across Europe, the United States, India, China, and to Alaska along the Alcan Highway, and often I'd taken my current woman friend. However, while she continued to be enthusiastic, as the week wore on, I began to wonder about her driving her own bike. Yes, she once traveled on the back of my motorcycle from San Francisco to New York, but 500 miles a day on a superhighway was no preparation for what we were planning. Sure, the roads in Pakistan had been bad, but there, too, she'd been merely a passenger. I've changed my mind, I announced one night at dinner. I don't think it's a good idea for you to drive your own bike. It's too difficult for a beginner. Remember how bad the roads were in India and Pakistan? The ones in China, Siberia, and Africa are going to be even rougher. She shot me a hard glance. You don't think I'm tough enough? No, I didn't say that. This is just a long, long trip. This is the longest and toughest ride of all. I can do it. I sighed. What had I started? A rider needs several thousand miles, 
several tens of thousands of miles under her belt for something like this. The pace we'll have to keep up, the terrible roads, the weeks, months of driving day after day will wear you out. You need experience. I remember how I was as a beginner. One time, I came off an interstate, for God's sake, and shot off into a cornfield because I was green and wasn't paying enough attention. The first time I was on a gravel road, the wheels skidded out from under me. I had bruises and raspberries everywhere. Well, in many of these places, we're going to wish we had something as good as a gravel road. We're not leaving for three months. I'll practice before we go. I took a deep breath and launched in. Look, I'm not explaining this well enough. On the China trip, I set out from Turpan to Hami with a film crew and a bus behind me. This was to be 250 miles, a quick day. We didn't take much food or water because we were assured the road was fine and we'd arrive in Hami before dark. Well, that day turned out to be 17 hours across roads that were a nightmare. We couldn't stop because there was nowhere to stop, no place to buy anything to eat. We were in the desert, so there was no water. It was like being halfway across a sea. We were in trouble no matter what you decide to do. Once we were out there, we had to push on. I think we'd all have died if we'd stopped. Two-thirds of the way there, the film crew was ready to give up, and they were riding in the bus. She stared at me so fixedly, I wasn't sure what she was thinking. I continued. There's going to be times on this trip when we'll have to bust a gut to keep going, and it's going to be hard, the hardest thing you've ever done. Half the world, more than half the world, is still rough, wild, unpaved, savage. Her eyes seemed to stare through me as she thought this over. You don't think I'm tough enough. I think you're plenty tough, but you might not have enough experience, even by the time we set out for such a long, hard trip. I'll work and make myself ready, Jim. We've traveled thousands of miles on your bike. I have a pretty good idea of what I'm getting into. But the pace... I run six miles a day to keep fit. You know enough to know this will wear you out as well as beat you up. There's no way you can build up enough stamina in just three months. I think I can. You also know I'm a real pusher sometimes. I have to be. Like on that hammy drive, when I had to make sure we made it. As a matter of fact, the same damn thing happened the next day. A simple 250-mile drive from hammy to Turpan took another 17 hours. Jim... I'll keep up. I was still not sure she knew what she was getting into. Not sure I knew what I was getting into. We can't go around the world driving three or four hours a day. Now she gave me a direct look. Jim, if you don't want me to come, say so. Go alone. No, I didn't say that. I'd love you to come. It'll be wonderful having you along. But we're going over the world's worst roads, through some of its harshest weather across the Sahara and the Andes, through epidemics in places where there aren't hospitals, telephones, airports, or even telegrams, where there are bandits, terrorists, who knows what. Over the next few days, we looked on the darker side of the trip. We discussed the possibility that we might get killed. Tabitha's reaction was that she could get killed in New York, too. As for me, I expected to make it, or otherwise I wouldn't have planned to set out. I had to figure out what to do with my investments while I was gone. Investment markets are volatile beasts, and you have to keep an eye on your positions. They've always fascinated me. One of the first things I noticed about them was that they went down as well as up, and I remembered how excited I was when I learned you could sell them short, sell what you don't own, and profit from their fall as well as from their rise. Where we were going, there wouldn't be phones, telexes, or faxes, much less daily newspapers. Most of my investments had always been long-term, so I didn't need to make any major moves. I cut back on my shorts, and I kept no futures positions at all. Then, early in 1990, most of my money was in utility stocks, U.S. government bonds, and foreign currencies, and I pretty much left it where it was. I owned utility stocks, mainly distressed ones with nuclear plants such as Illinois Power and Niagara Mohawk, because I was convinced they'd hit bottom and would solve their problems. I thought U.S. interest rates were headed south, so I was bullish, optimistic, on bonds and bearish, pessimistic on the dollar, that is, I expected the price of bonds to rise and that of the dollar to fall. 
I figured that politicians would do everything they could to keep the economy going. Since they're not very smart, all they really know how to do is cut interest rates. I bought foreign currencies, mainly certificates of deposit denominated in guilders or Deutschmarks, reasoning that the dollar would go down as the politicians cut interest rates. As an American, I hated to see this happen. But as an investor about to set off around the world, I had chanced upon the perfect investment scenario, because these were holdings I wouldn't have to watch on a daily basis. I would make money if I were right, and I wouldn't get wiped out if I were wrong, because government bonds and utility stocks might go down, but basically they were secure instruments over time, as were the currencies of sound countries. Whenever I travel, because of who I am, I notice promising investment opportunities. While this wasn't an investment trip by any means, I suspected I would visit promising stock exchanges. In addition to experiencing the world and its people firsthand, in the vivid and close way you can on a motorcycle, I knew I would learn about the markets in Africa, China, and South America, which I felt might explode in the 90s. I was also curious about the markets in Australia and New Zealand. I'd made a lot of money for myself and others by investing in sleepy markets that exploded upward. In fact, one of my first stops on this trip was to be Austria, where I was to give a speech to the investment clients of Oberbank. A few years before, my investment in the Austrian stock market had quintupled in three years. I wondered if I would find more such places to invest. With the world throwing off the shackles of socialism and communism, I figured not only was the time right, but the opportunity might not be repeated for decades, if ever again in my life. Chapter 3 Crossing Europe As the weeks sped by, Tapitha stuck with it. She was going to go. I still worried that the trip was wrong for her, and that she would change her mind at the last minute. But March got closer, and we kept moving forward as if we were going to do it. We bought spare cables, mirrors, a carburetor, and extra Michelin tires. We packed rolls of 3M's magic construction tape, two inches wide, clear, and seemingly indestructible, my favorite item for emergency repairs. We got sleeping bags, rain suits, and an extra helmet. Tabitha hunted up the wedding band she'd used on our previous adventures. We'd learned it made traveling a lot simpler if she wore one. We bought maps and plotted routes, as AAA had no trip tickets for getting through the Central Asian Republics, Siberia, and the Sahara. We doped out ways to get money into places without American Express offices and where the sight of a traveler's check would produce suspicious stares. I battened down my office, and I made sure someone would look after my house while I was away. There were vaccinations to take and visas to obtain. However, I wasn't going to get any letters of introduction, nor did I pack my address book. We made the choice to make this trip serendipitously and spontaneously. We wouldn't depend on old friends, personal or business, to put us up and pull us into gatherings of their friends. It would be more of an adventure to meet our own new friends, friends of the road. In this way, we would have a different adventure, maybe better, maybe worse. We would play the trip as we found it. And still I was holding my breath, hoping Tabitha wouldn't change her mind, hoping she'd come. Finally, the big day arrived. I couldn't believe it. March 25th, 1990 was a bright spring day, and I was about to set out around the world. The way we planned the first leg, we'd leave from the west coast of Ireland and drive across Europe and China to Japan, becoming the first ground travelers ever to ride from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The second leg would be to return to Ireland across Siberia, Russia, and Central Europe. Another first, the Pacific to the Atlantic. Back to back, the trip would be 20,000 miles. Tabitha created the bikes and took them out to the Aer Lingus freight terminal. I wondered if we'd taken care of everything. Had I given enough instructions about the boiler for next winter? What would the house sitter do if the roof leaked? Too late now. We were in the air. For a few minutes, a sense of unreality and strangeness struck me, and I mused on who I was and how I happened to be hurtling over the Atlantic on what might prove to be a fool's errand. <laughs> 
We had pored over our maps and decided that the westernmost point in Ireland was Dunquin, population less than 100. It would be our starting point. In Ireland, after uncrating the bikes, we drove from Shannon Airport through the lush countryside to Dunquin, where we looked for the post office. It was Saturday afternoon when we arrived in the tiny village of thatch-roofed stone cottages and haystacks, its lush green slopes topping slate-gray cliffs. The post office was closed. We knocked on the door anyway. It turned out that the postmistress lived there, just as post office officials sometimes did back in Alabama when I was a child, and we told her we were traveling around the world and wanted to prove we had been here in Dunquin at the start. Ruddy-faced, sixty and plump, Mrs. Campion reminded me of dozens of Alabama churchwomen, pillars of their communities, who had clucked approvingly as I'd served as an acolyte in the Episcopal Church. Would she sell us some postcards, then postmark and date them? She laughed with Irish delight at the whole absurd idea and invited us in for a cup of tea. She signed the cards, then a Gaelic student who was there signed them, and then we signed them, and then she stamped them. It was like a party, the official start. Riding through this part of Ireland was wonderful, great for motorcycles, the roads curvy and small and convoluted, green and beautiful. All my life, from my history courses at Yale to my work at Oxford and later on Wall Street, I've studied geography, politics, economics, and history intensely, believing they are interrelated, and I've used what I've learned to invest in world markets. I was on the lookout for investment opportunities for some country and its investment market about to take off, where I could jump in and make five, ten, fifteen times what I put in. Ireland wouldn't be one of those countries. In fact, the lush countryside made me sad. For centuries, Ireland has been in a state of war or rebellion or depression. It seemed such a shame that despite all its beauty, despite the ebullient, warm-hearted Irish temperament, there should be for so long this raging instability. All the country had was tourism and pasture land. Although I figured with its pool of semi-skilled labor, it might make it as the back office for English or German banks, insurance companies, and brokerages. Ireland is a victim of statism, which my dictionary defines as the concentration of economic controls and planning in the hands of a highly centralized government, and which I further define as the belief that the state is the mechanism best suited for solving most, if not all, of society's ills, be they health-related, natural disasters, poverty, job training, or injured feelings. Statism is the great political disease of the 20th century, with communist, socialist, and many democratic nations infected to a greater or lesser degree. When the political history of our century is written, its greatest story will be how a hundred variants of statism failed. When a country is run by the government, when the government not only owns the post office, the telephone system, the railroads, and the utilities, but also the service sector and light and heavy industry, the country begins to have the air of the U.S. Postal Service in the 90s, compared with what it was in the 50s. A couple of generations later, all vigor is drained out of that society. Across the Irish Sea, Margaret Thatcher was the first major example of a leader who reversed this trend. When she was elected in 1979, Britain was bankrupt from its government's efforts to solve every social problem. She began to sell off the assets and businesses that had been nationalized by the Labour Party, invigorating the country's economy. Ireland was late in beginning this process. I had last been in Ireland in 1964 while a student at Oxford, and it now shocked me how empty the countryside was. What hit me was that the talented genes kept leaving Ireland, and that they had been leaving for generations. That didn't mean there weren't some smart, delightful, wonderful people here, but there had been a great migration out of the gene pool. On our second day out, near Cork, Tabitha's bike broke down. I had no idea what was wrong, and for all her mechanics training, neither did Tabitha. Back in New York, we had both signed up for the BMW mechanics course. But with even the best intentions, I had never made a single class. Other things were always more pressing. 
Besides, we both knew she was far more mechanically oriented than I was. I can't operate Venetian blinds without getting tangled in the cord. Tabitha not only had time and a mechanical bent, but her father had taught her a lot about machinery, how machines worked. This was one more aspect that had attracted me to her. Before we left, we had hired her BMW instructor, Scott Johnson, who had a passion for these motorcycles, to come over and give her extra lessons, private tutorials. Over several winter weeks, Tabitha worked with him in the side yard of the house. Late in the frigid days, sometimes at night under a lamp's yellow glare, they'd take a bike apart, put it back together, and then take it apart again. While he showed her what each mysterious part did and how it worked, I was doing a million other things. I was the host of a TV show about economic affairs in addition to teaching finance at Columbia. But most of my attention had gone into organizing my investments and devising ways to put my New York life in the deep freezer while we were gone. Unfortunately, all Tabitha's training had been in the classroom and not on the road. She could strip down an engine and put it back together, but she couldn't diagnose what was wrong when it broke down. In this case, we needed practical street smarts, not theoretical expertise. Along came a local motorcycle gang, dressed the way they are everywhere in the world. Barry O'Keefe and Kevin Sullivan, the leaders, turned out to be wonderful folks, just good old motorcycle trash, like us. They loaded Tabitha's bike into a truck and fixed it in five minutes at their shop. The bike looked good, black with white racing stripes on the fairing, chrome exhaust pipe gleaming. They invited us to a dive called the Mojo Pub, where we had a party. We crossed Ireland and headed for England, exultant. After a week in England, I was antsy to leave for Europe. I needed to get to Linz to speak to Oberbank's clients about developments in Central Europe. As we had been to Europe many times, we zipped across its familiar face, a thousand miles in a few days. During the 527 miles from Paris to Munich, we were pummeled by cold spring rains. No fun on a motorcycle, but a real-world consequence of being so close to the road. I led, and Tabitha complained about doing such a long distance in one day, but I was sure she would get used to the pace. I had fond, fond memories of Austria and its stock market, where I'd made one of my best coups. Six years before, believing the time was right to invest in Vienna, the sleepy former capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I had put out feelers by calling the New York office of Kreditenstalt, its largest bank. I asked the manager how I could go about investing in his country's stock market. We don't have a stock market, he said. I laughed. This was music to my ears. The largest bank in the country, and the New York rep didn't even know he had a stock market. I knew there was one, and that big changes were taking place in Austria. The bank manager's ignorance showed me how wonderfully obscure the stock market was. Just what I like as an investor. I assured him that his country had a stock market and asked if he could find out how I could buy shares. It was hopeless dealing with him. But that just whetted my appetite. The largest bank in Austria, and no one knew how to buy shares on its stock market. I knew what was going on in Germany, that it was becoming an industrial powerhouse, and how Austria, like Germany, was loosening its socialistic chains. In November of 1984, I went to Austria. I went to the stock exchange. Nobody was there. It was dead. Open only a few hours a week. Finally, I found the one guy in charge of the stock market at the Kreditenstalt Bank's main office, Otto Breuer. One guy handling shares, without a secretary, in the country's largest bank. I felt as though I were in knee-high cotton. The Austrian exchange had less than 30 stocks listed, and it had fewer than 20 members. Back before the First World War, there had been 4,000 members on the Austro-Hungarian Stock Exchange. Then it had been the largest stock market in Central Europe, dominant, as New York and Tokyo are today. I got Otto to take me to see the government official in charge of the stock market, Werner Milberg, who assured me there would be changes made in the laws that would encourage people to invest in stocks. The government recognized that it had to have a capital market. What changes? 
I asked, masking my excitement. Lower taxes on dividends, said Herr Melberg. We're going to make the dividends tax-free if you reinvest them in stocks. Give tax credits for investing in stocks. Give special provisions in the laws for pension funds and insurance companies to invest in stocks, which they hadn't had before. Other countries had done these things, and they had achieved dramatic results. These were copycat measures. The Austrians had seen the German stock market going up. But at the same time, I thought about the portfolio managers in Germany. They read German, while Americans might not, and these German portfolio managers knew where Austria was, practically a suburb of Germany. If this market started to move, they would pile in and drive it up even higher. But ever cautious, the first rule in investing is not to lose any capital, I went to the head of an Austrian labor union and asked him about the position of the Socialist Party, capitalism's loyal opposition, so to speak, on all of this. He told me the socialist crowd was in favor of these changes. They didn't like stock markets, but they knew they were necessary to make the country go. That was it. No opposition from the opposition. I decided to pile in. My attitude is, if you believe in a country, you should buy shares of every decent stock on its exchange. If you've got the right concept going for you, they're all going to move up together. I bought shares in everything that had a solid balance sheet. A home-building construction company, finance and manufacturing companies, banks, other construction firms, and a big machinery company. A few weeks later, I was on the Barron's Roundtable, an annual forum for discussing investment ideas. I reminded the other members that the year before, I had invested in Germany, but this year, the country to invest in was Austria. I laid out my reasons. The paper comes out on Saturday morning. Saturday, Sunday went by. Everything was quiet. On Monday morning, Otto Breuer, the guy without the secretary at the Kreditenstalt, came in late. His desk was covered with phone messages, and the market was going through the roof. Calls were pouring in from London, Munich, New York. Buy me Austrian shares! Otto had no idea what was going on. People just kept calling from everywhere. Barons is red all over the world, wanting to buy shares on this dead stock exchange. Finally, somebody said to him, Hey, don't you read Barons? Of course he didn't, because this was a backwater job. The market started to move up, which naturally attracted even more interest. Now, I can't move a stock market. All I can do is point out the reality of a situation. It was one of those things, a simple idea, but once you looked at it, it was dead clear, and everybody piled in. To this day, people say I kissed the sleeping beauty and woke her up. The smart ones say that, while the dumb ones think I actually did something magical. But everybody said what a beautiful thing it was when the princess woke up, because everybody made so much money. The stock market went up 125% that year, and then went up more and more. Well, when the Austrians figured out that I was Prince Charming, the Kreditenstalt invited me to speak at their quarterly forum, at which Kissinger had spoken not long before, a forum where I would definitely be heard. So I went, and I said, This ain't over yet, folks, hang on. You are all going to make a whole lot more money in the Austrian market. This thing is big. You're going from a state of gross undervaluation to a normal valuation, and your economy's growing. Just because it's double up now doesn't mean more money's not going to be made. The newspapers gave this lots of coverage. The Kreditstalt people rented me a motorcycle, and I, the eccentric Jim Rogers, according to the newspapers, drove up to Prague. I finally sold out of Austria in the spring of 1987. The market was up 400% or 500% by then, because I was worried about stock markets around the world. I was worried about a financial crisis, yet the Austrian market was one of the last ones I sold. Now the Austrians had asked me back to make another speech. I was eager to get to Linz. I prefer to ride hard and arrive where I have to be and relax. But the closer I got, the less keen I was on speaking. The flattery of being called the father of the Austrian stock market was nice, but this time around I was terribly bearish on Austria and all of Central Europe. 
the Austrian stock market was ripe for collapse, and like people everywhere, those involved weren't going to be happy to hear the bad news. Chapter 4 Linz The Berlin Wall had just fallen, and everybody in the global market in early 1990 was certain that Central Europe, historically defined as that central part of Europe, west of European Russia and the Ukraine, was going to be the next economic miracle, another Southeast Asia. The consensus bullish argument went like this. The stock markets in Germany and Austria had historic ties to Central Europe, where their companies had owned businesses. The only neutral economy between the eastern and western blocks of Europe, Austria was a natural crossroads. Vienna had been the economic and political gateway to Central Europe historically and geographically, and it would flourish as these new democracies grew. As late as the early 20th century, Vienna was the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which over the centuries had dominated Central Europe. The Austrians had maintained closer ties to Central and Eastern Europe than had Germany, which had been the enemy. Plus, during the Cold War, all the world's spies used to go through Vienna because it was a neutral city, and it was right there. I didn't see any of it this way. I thought anybody who put money into the Soviet Union and much of Central Europe was going to lose it because of the strife and chaos to come. There wasn't one legitimate border in the entire area. All its borders were settled in 1945 by victorious armies, either granting rewards or extracting revenge, and I didn't expect many of them to last. As the Central Europeans discovered that democracy didn't automatically create prosperity, the politicians would print money to win votes. The resulting inflation and economic collapse would only heighten ethnic hostilities and lead to constant strife. Hyperinflation would turn Central Europe into a South American-type economy long before it could become the next Southeast Asia. Word was leaking out about my ideas. An Austrian magazine article said Sleeping Beauty's Prince thought Central Europe was going to collapse. Suddenly, this little bank that had invited me to speak, the ninth largest bank in Austria, had a tiger by the tail. Everybody in Austria wanted to come to Linz for the speech. It had originally been for the bank's own customers, but now it had to hire the biggest hall in town. The bank sold it out and had to install video monitors outside the hall for those who couldn't get in to watch. So we rolled into Linz and I got up there in my black leather jacket and bow tie and told them how I saw it. Central Europe was going to be a disaster. I said the Austrian stock market had been going up for some time, seven fat years, and that we were now at a point of hysteria. I described the classic signs. All the university students wanted to do was go into the stock market. People were leaving their jobs to go into stock market work because it was such an easy and wonderful way to make a living. By every traditional measure, low dividend yields, high price earnings ratios, staggering volume of trades, a top was near. This was a classic speculative bubble. Only a pinprick would be needed to burst the balloon. This is coming to an end, I said, and you'd better be selling, because it's going to go down by at least 50%. I don't know if it's going to happen next week or next month, but it's going to happen over the next few months. Several questions from the audience. Aren't you just saying this because you sold short our market and wanted to go down? I previously had said publicly that I was short the Austria fund, which was the only way you could short the Austrian stock market. If the market fell, I would make a profit. I'm trying to explain to you that there is going to be a major change coming in your market that has nothing to do with whether I'm alive and well or have ever been here, I explained. There were more hostile questions from the audience, because nobody wanted this to happen. Why was I saying this, they muttered. This wasn't nice. Why are you ruining our country, they said. We only invited you back because we thought you would say nice things. They didn't want to look at the facts, but only at the idea that a big new market was opening up, that freedom was coming. They forgot that democracy doesn't equal prosperity. Nor could they see that when the expected prosperity didn't arrive, the new democratic leaders would be blamed. All these countries, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Czechoslovakia, 
had huge foreign debts, among the highest in the world on a per capita basis. None of these countries had a thing to sell. After all, their industries had produced only shoddy goods for almost forty years, which they had sold to captive markets in the Comic-Con. Except in the coming tourist boomlet, nobody in the West was going to buy anything, not a wristwatch, much less a car, from these countries. Expectations would be aroused, and next time there wouldn't be Ceausescu to shoot or communists to throw out. One of history's lessons is that truly downtrodden peoples do not rise up, but hell hath no fury like suppressed peoples whose expectations have been aroused. And now that their expectations were piqued, this fury would have to find a target. The ethnic, national, and religious rivalries that had plagued the area for centuries would erupt again. None of the borders in Central Europe were rational, historically, linguistically, religiously, or ethnically. Could anyone explain why Moldavia was part of the USSR and not Romania? The Moldavians wanted to be part of Romania, while the Hungarians and Germans who were dumped into Romania desperately wanted out, and for good reason. Yugoslavia, an artificial conglomeration of six countries, had never been a nation except for a few forced decades in the 20th century, and certainly wasn't one now. History was on the march, and nobody wanted to listen. The next day, Tabitha and I left. The Austrian stock market fell off a point or two as a result of my speech. Nothing spectacular, or we might never have gotten out. However, there was a big controversy in the press. Because no one was allowed to short Austrian stocks, there were no bears in the Austrian market. Nobody wanted it to go down. It was shoot the messenger all over again. People never want to hear bad news. Never want to hear what upsets their view of life. Back in the oil boom days, guys on Wall Street would tell me oil was going to $100 a barrel, and I'd tell them it was impossible, that when the price got too high, the same thing would happen that always happened with a high price. Somebody would find more of whatever it was, or somebody else would make a substitute. Consumption would go down. People would lower their thermostats or wear sweaters. The Wall Street types would get mad and call me crazy. They will always tell you, this time it's different. I hear that a lot, but it's never different. It's just a different situation. Trees don't grow to the sky, stock markets don't go up forever, and high prices cut back demand. With prices high, a million guys pile in to figure out how to take advantage of all that money, bringing in supply, and eventually driving down the price. No one has ever repealed the law of supply and demand and no one ever will, not Republicans, Democrats, Communists, or Capitalists. It's a law of nature, a mechanism many governments can't seem to understand or trust to make things right. So, in the United States, we had to endure gas lines because the government thought it could legislate price. Well, it can't, or at least not for very long. Chapter 5 Central Europe it was clear and bright the day we pushed toward Hungary, a little cool because this was April and we were coming out of the mountains. What struck me on nearing the border was what a vast flat plain we were approaching. Lots of farms, lots of farm buildings, broad flat fields. Historically, all the way to the Ukraine, this was the breadbasket of Europe, the Kansas and Nebraska for Vienna and Berlin. I realized as we came out of the mountains and onto the plains, how often borders followed geographical features and changes, such as rivers, mountains, lakes, deserts. Here the border ran along the edge between the mountains and the fertile plains. Coming out of the first border checkpoint toward the second, I was leading. We slowly drove along a big S-curve covered with a long oil slick. All communist cars leak oil. I checked Tabitha in my rearview mirror, and she was leaning to the right, accelerating, as you're supposed to coming out of a curve. When I next checked my rear view, I saw her bike bouncing in the air, from its right side crash bars to its left, and then back onto its right, but no Tabitha. I panicked, pulled to the side, and looked back. Her bike was in gear, now on its left side, but I couldn't see her. The bike bounced upright, 
With its throttle fixed and back wheel turning, the bike's gyroscopic tendency made it bounce back upright, then over again, up and down, up and down. Every time the back wheel touched the ground, it gained new thrust. Where was Tabitha? The bike was still moving on the other side of the two-lane road, into oncoming traffic which scattered out of its way. She was gone, and that damn bike was still flopping around. I jumped off my bike and raced back. She was on the ground next to the road, struggling to get up. I was terrified. I pictured her bloody, torn, ripped, this beautiful woman I loved. What had I done? I'd rarely traveled with another cyclist before, much less an inexperienced one. Had I put her through something she couldn't handle? Scarcely a week into the trip, and here she was injured, possibly maimed. But she sprang up and said she was okay. Relief flooded through me. As she pulled off her helmet, I saw she wasn't bloody, not even scratched. Her leathers, boots, gloves, helmet, and the crash bar shielding the engine and her legs had all worked, protecting her as they were supposed to. Plus, she'd been lucky. Yards away, the bike was on its side, still in gear, its rear wheel still turning. She was so little hurt that she was able to run with me to it. We flipped off the emergency switch and gas cocks and pulled it upright to stop any gas leaks. The Hungarians had left their cars and were gaping. When it was clear that we were okay, they waved and got back in their cars and drove on. I was worried about Tabitha. She was more worried about the bike because she thought she was okay. But maybe she had a concussion and didn't know it. Sometimes these things didn't show up for a day or so. Maybe her parents had been right. Her mother had said this was madness. Her father had put his foot down, even though at seventeen he had gone to Europe, and against his parents' specific instructions bought a motorcycle and toured about for the summer. Maybe I should have found a soldier of fortune to come along, or should have done this alone. After she assured me three or four times that she was okay, I had to buy it. We eyeballed the bike, and it looked okay, too. We were delighted to find that it started up right away. I looked Tabitha over again to see if she had holes in her leathers and was hurt someplace and didn't feel it. I figured we had been going twenty to thirty miles an hour, not at high speed, but she didn't know how to handle an oil slick because of her inexperience. No tears in her leathers, and on second inspection the bike again seemed to be fine. Here near the border, there was no place to stop for a cup of coffee or to rest, so there was little to do but press on to Budapest. If something was wrong with Tabitha internally, better to be closer to a large city than out here in the middle of farmland. So we set out again. I had to hand it to her. I thought her driving might change or falter after the spill, but I noticed nothing in my mirror. Same steady course as before. We did have a recovery period, because we were in a queue at the border shortly thereafter, but then we barreled along to Budapest. Such courage told me she was the right person to take with me. After all, at the beginning of any trip like this there were bound to be problems. Still, the crash gnawed at me. These weren't bad roads, not compared with what was coming up in the Central Asian Republics and China. Maybe a thousand miles of practice before starting out to motorcycle around the world wasn't enough. Had my bullheadedness and optimism pushed Tabitha into a trip for which she wasn't ready? I pushed the thought aside. I had no choice. More farmland, more plains. It didn't take a genius to see that despite Hungary's glorious past as the center of an empire, agriculture was its future. With a market of only ten million people, it wouldn't be easy to set up a manufacturing base, and it would be even harder to train Hungarians, used to the commercial standards of communism, to produce high-quality manufactured goods, the hallmark of the nearby Germans. On the other hand, it made no sense for some of the advanced countries, Great Britain, France, and Germany, to compete with Hungary in agriculture, because they weren't able to. It was absurd that Europe kept trying to subsidize British farmers when so many nearby Hungarians had vast, fertile plains. As it grew dark, we pulled into Budapest. Some time ago, the city had been two cities, Buda and Pest, 
one on each side of the Danube, but now it was all one. It had been a major provincial capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and back before World War I, it had been very rich. As I drove through the shadowy dusk, feeling like a Visigoth in battered leathers riding through Rome, I was awed by the beautiful 19th and early 20th century buildings with their classical stone architecture. I figured they would be here forever because the Hungarians didn't have enough money to tear them down and put up new ones. Budapest was going to be a museum. It was built when there had been lavish amounts of money, and then the country had suddenly become poor. By the time Hungary becomes wealthy enough again to afford to tear these buildings down and replace them, they will be too historic, and the Hungarians won't allow themselves to destroy them. Prague, too, is in the same boat, a museum for decades to come, frozen in time. The next day we were off to Belgrade. That morning I had hosted a special for Financial News Network concerning the opening of Hungary. It was supposed to finish up in the morning, but, as is typical in Central Europe, we didn't finish till late in the day, and Tabitha and I got a late start. Both of us were unhappy over the delay, and we were hurrying to make up the lost time. I was still in front. The road got much bumpier, pitted by potholes. It became more winding, with terrible grating, less shoulder, and it wasn't as smooth. I tore along, passing cars and trucks. Tabitha kept falling behind. At one point I passed another truck, accelerated and looked in my mirror. No Tabitha. I kept looking for a few minutes. Nothing. I pulled over and stopped. No cars, no traffic coming up behind me, and I had passed a slew of cars and trucks. I knew immediately something had happened back there. Tabitha. I'd pushed her, and she was inexperienced, which had caused that first spill, and now I'd been pushing to get to Belgrade. I spun around and hightailed it back. I saw her on the side of the road, off her bike, picking up things. Tools, maps, sweaters, shoes. Everything she had been carrying in her saddlebags was scattered over the road. A few Yugoslavs were helping her. But another miracle. She wasn't hurt. I followed the path of her strewn baggage and looked over into the ravine next to the road, which was ten to twelve feet deep. The bike was at the bottom at the tail end of a trail of spare parts and jeans and shirts and sweaters. I saw that Tabitha was all right, as she had been walking around for ten to twenty minutes before I got back. It hit me that she was only twenty-four and didn't know what she was doing. Maybe I didn't know what I was doing bringing her. Should I call the whole trip off before I led her into a fatal accident? I had worried about bringing Tabitha from the first day I'd broached the trip to her. Back then, I had wanted to take my 1,000cc bike, on which I had mounted a custom seat, radio, extra gas tanks, and heated handlebars. Tabitha had wanted to take my classic 1967 Boxer BMW R69 US, a great bike, but so classic it didn't sport an electric starter, just an old fangled kick pedal. It had been fine with me for her to take the bike, but it needed refurbishing, including a crash bar on each side of the motor to protect the rider. There was only one place in the country that could do that kind of work right, and it was in Ohio. So, after the driving course, and after practicing on the streets of New York, she had taken off alone for Ohio in the middle of winter to get this classic BMW in first-class shape for the mother of all motorcycle trips. January. Rain, snow, and cold. Bursts of wind on the freeway ice patches, inviting spills under the wheels of tractor trailers. I was worried about her. Pretty gutsy, I thought, and dangerous. But as she had put it to me before she left, if she couldn't handle driving to Ohio on a smooth freeway in the middle of winter, she damn sure couldn't make it across the ruts that passed for roads in Zaire and Siberia. The hours passed slowly, and I was anxious to hear her voice every night. The most dangerous time for any motorcyclist is the first six months of driving, because she thinks she knows what she's doing, but she doesn't. She made it, proving to me she had what it took for such a tough trip. On the way back, she stopped at her aunt's in Pittsburgh, 
The aunt and the neighbors were impressed with her young niece driving up on a motorcycle, making her way from Ohio to New York. She didn't tell them what she really had in mind, not wanting to deal with the flap that would have caused. Now that bike lay in a ravine in Yugoslavia, smashed up. I took a deep breath and climbed down. The bike was a mess. The taillight was torn apart, the luggage rack was bent to hell, and it looked like this was it. This bike had had it. Even one of the spark plugs was bent. There were a lot of guys standing around, so I commandeered them to come down and help me push it back up onto the road. The front wheel wouldn't turn because the fender was bent into it, so we had to lift and push the bike up the ravine side. Tabitha thought the trip was over, that the bike was gone. But when I looked specifically at each part, I saw that the bike could be made to run, although it wasn't going to be a pretty sight. The fairing that had been lovingly crafted and pinstriped in Ohio was a mess, but I didn't see any major cracks in the motor or the frame. Tabitha, however, appeared to be in shock. So much had happened since the spill yesterday that it seemed like an eternity had passed. A border crossing, Budapest, some sightseeing, and then tearing off toward another border. She berated me for pushing the pace, and I accepted it. It was now six or seven o'clock, dusk. The police showed up, and we explained that we had to get to Belgrade. Did they know who could take us? They disappeared into a little town and came back with a guy in a trailer. A little trailer. I just said to them, God Almighty. But I kept in mind that we were now in a communist country. No parts, no mechanics, no BMW dealers, no nothing. What I did know was that in the past the Yugoslav police had ridden BMW motorcycles, so maybe we could find somebody who remembered how to fix one. Tabitha climbed onto the back of my bike, and I followed the little trailer carrying her bike. What had happened, she said, resting her face against my shoulder, was that she had tried to pass a truck. After she was past it, another truck had come barreling down at her, and she whipped back in as fast as she could, but the bike started fishtailing. She had lost control and went toward the ravine, but fortunately she'd been thrown to the side, otherwise she'd probably have been killed, five hundred pounds of bike on top of her. It was a very, very serious thing, and yet she was fine. If the bike had gone down into the path of traffic coming up behind her, she'd have been run over. She was sad and troubled, almost in shock. She questioned whether she should go home, but didn't know what to do. I was furious with myself for pushing the pace, for getting her into any of this. I vowed to change my behavior. Chapter 6 On to Istanbul The next day, down an old dirt road that could have come out of the Alabama of my boyhood, we found, as I had hoped, a mechanic who had worked on BMWs back when the Yugoslav police had used them. In the makeshift shed behind his house, I pointed out to him what he needed to do to make Tabitha's bike run again. He even found an old Honda taillight in his junk box, which we agreed to take. We couldn't afford to be purists now. He would weld the luggage rack back together. We had packed extra spark plugs, but even though we looked through everything, we couldn't find them. Lost in the crack-up, we suppose. The worst part of the damage was done to the fairing, which was smashed. Come back at five, the mechanic told us. After Tabitha was checked over by a doctor, we spent the rest of the day running errands, replacing lost items, and touring Belgrade. It was run down, seedy, dreary, and gray. It had never had a period of great wealth, but there were some distinguished old buildings. Historically, Belgrade had mainly been a provincial center under various empires, but it had been more like a Chattanooga, not in an Atlanta or a Pittsburgh. The communists had run it down further. Its few new buildings were communist-style architecture, drab, square, gray boxes. No lines, no dazzle, no imagination, just the odd hammer and sickle tacked on. We got a good night's sleep and were up at five for the drive to Turkey. A couple nights rest and a day off and Tabitha was her old perky self, ready to ride. I vowed to take it easy. 
Even though these communist countries were drab and gray, the motorcycling itself was fun. Riding the bike, having the wind in our faces, seeing the countryside firsthand made it exciting. There wasn't much to stop and marvel over, but we saw, felt, experienced the fields and roads and the air in a way we wouldn't have by plane, train, or car. This time, I let Tabitha lead and set the pace, and we made great time. I was delighted that we had lost only a day, because I had been mentally mapping out the trip, figuring what would be our problems, trying to anticipate them. We had a deadline imposed on us by the Chinese ferry system, the Siberian ferry system, and winter. I had conceived of the trip as a two-year summer trip, by moving constantly around the globe, and by crossing back and forth from the northern to the southern hemispheres at the right time, I figured we could stay in summer throughout the trip, or at least in late spring and early autumn. However, if we missed the first ferry from China to Japan, we would then likely miss the Siberian ferry. In the United States, ferries run every day, and if you miss one, you wait a few hours for the next. The ferries from China to Japan and from Japan to Siberia go only once a month, and even then not on any regular schedule. If we missed one, it could throw us a month into the Russian winter, possibly two, which could prove fatal to the trip, and to us. Napoleon and Hitler both blithely thought they could conquer the Russian winter. As history has shown, they found it was nothing to play around with. Plus, if we were delayed too much, it meant we'd wind up in Europe, Africa, and Australia in the winter. We'd go from a worldwide summer trip to a worldwide winter trip, which was madness. It was urgent that we meet the ferry deadlines. We reached Bulgaria, our third communist border. We'd allowed hours to cross from one country to another. You never knew what you were going to run into. But the world was changing, and it was a fairly simple crossing. Shortly after, Tabitha's engine began to run in a raggedy fashion, as if the fuel line were clogged. A drain plug from the engine's right carburetor had fallen out, and it wouldn't hold gas. We searched back along the road for it, but no luck. She rooted in the garbage by the side of the road for something makeshift. I had visions of having to find another truck to haul us into God knew where. Nobody out here would have that damned particular carburetor plug. With this kind of luck, we'd never make it to the ferry to Japan. Had I come off half-cocked, with an amateur for a mechanic and without thinking the real problems through? As I saw it, the problem was that Tabitha had ignored my brilliant advice. I had wanted to buy her a BMW R100RT motorcycle like mine, a heavy 1,000cc machine with electric starter, cassette deck, heated handlebars, all the comforts of home. More important, it would have been new and less likely to have problems, plus we'd have been using the same spare parts. She'd refused to ride a bike so big and cumbersome and ended up on a classic that wasn't bearing up well. Tabitha held up something that looked like a muddy black snake. What's that? Just what we need, she said. An old inner tube. Come on, Tabitha, that'll never work. Get out that magic 3M tape you packed, she said. I've got an idea. She cut a piece of rubber and cleaned it. She used the tape to strap it to the bottom of the carburetor. We cranked up the bike. It sounded all right, and no gas was leaking. She gave me a big smile of triumph, and I had to grin back even though I was worried. The next town was Sofia, but the book said there was no BMW dealer there. The next one was in Istanbul, 400 miles away and I saw us stopping every few miles to retape the rubber to the bottom of that carburetor. I made sure we packed the dirty inner tube. Let's push it, I said. See if we can get to Istanbul tonight, get this fixed. We did push it, and to my amazement we got to Istanbul without the jury-rigged plug coming loose. Tabitha was ecstatic we'd met this problem and conquered it. At the dealer in Turkey we found the right carburetor plug and we bought spark plugs. Tabitha spent some time with the mechanics going over her bike. Between us and Tokyo, 6,000 miles away, there was only one more BMW dealer, and he was in Ankara, only 300 miles farther on. We looked around, 
I had been in Istanbul before. Tabitha had not. She had been an Islamic studies major in college, so to her this was enthralling. She spent a day going from mosque to mosque. I spent the day bringing my log up to date, which is to say I wrote a string of postcards covering our travels to my parents. Since they save all my postcards, I have killed two birds with one stone. I did my daily six-mile run, and I got our laundry done, all of which served to pull me together. The trip had been on top of me up to this point, instead of my being on top of the trip. In the back of my mind, I'd had the idea that eventually I would invest in Turkey. Even though it's been the sick man of Europe over the past couple of centuries, historically it's been a political and economic crossroads between Europe and the Middle East. Now that it was becoming reattached to Europe, I couldn't see why it wouldn't be as important as it had been in earlier centuries when trade between the East and West had flourished, especially with the opening of the European community. So I tried to find a reason to put some money here, but I couldn't. Not only was it still in the grip of statism, nothing seemed dramatically cheap, nor was the government on the verge of making some big economic change. True, the market was wildly overpriced, and I could sell it short, hoping to profit on the downturn, but selling short requires more attention than being long. I was not in any position to be attentive for the next couple of years. Tabitha and I assessed how we were doing. She blamed her accidents on the fast pace. I agreed. We both realized that she needed more experience, so I suggested she stay in front. In fact, I wanted her in front from the beginning, but she'd wanted me to set the pace, find the right road, steer around the potholes. Also, I was worried about her getting rear-ended, because to me it seemed she never looked in her rearview mirror. As a truck passed her, she would swerve to the right as if she hadn't seen him come up. I would keep muttering, look in your rearview mirror. So, with Tabitha reveling in the Muslim culture, we pushed on. We drove into the Cappadocia region, passing breathtaking views much like those in Arizona and Utah and around the Grand Canyon. We were now on the last leg of the old Silk Roads, the fabled east-west trade routes from China to Europe that for two thousand years carried Chinese silk, millet, anise, ginger, rose bushes, and mulberry trees westward. Through this network of trails and mountain passes, the Persians exported dates, pistachio nuts, peaches, dyes, and the resins, frankincense, and myrrh into China and Europe. Through here, India shipped spinach, the lotus, sandalwood, pepper, and most important, cotton. Through this route in the 13th century, Marco Polo, 17 years old, made his first overland journey into China. In my mind's eye I saw the early caravans, some of which were composed of a thousand camels and dozens of soldiers. For months at a time these living freight trains would move through some of the harshest landscapes on the planet, impeded by searing waterless deserts and snow-locked mountain passes. Storms, filling the travelers' mouths, eyes, and ears with sand, would force them to pause for days. As they picked their way over rough, broken paths, they would be assaulted by mountain sickness and snow blindness. Of course, bandits, attracted by the rich cargoes, were a danger, too. We passed thousands of dwellings dug out of lava or sandstone, walls of man-made caves carved into cliffs. The Christians had dug huge underground cities here, some more than a hundred feet deep, to avoid their enemies. When we examined a map of Turkey, we saw why. This was the only way through this part of the world, because the Black Sea was to the north and the Mediterranean was to the south. Over the centuries, any army heading east or west would have pushed through this corridor. The Christian Turks, therefore, had built their cities underground and in the sides of mountains so they would be disguised. These cities had been discovered by travelers over the past five years, and now a tourist boom had started. I hit a pothole and put a huge dent in my front wheel, which made me worry about the next ten thousand miles. In Ankara I had the dent pounded out, and we hit the road again. Now we would find out how well we'd planned. Not only was there no BMW dealer between here and Japan, 
There wasn't a single shop from which to buy so much as a spare tire or a spark plug for a western vehicle, car or motorcycle. Six thousand miles to Tokyo, across mountains and deserts, with nothing more than what was strapped to our rear frames. We had four tires tied to our luggage racks, but once those were gone, we'd be out of luck. We made a dramatic drop to sea level, but the Black Sea, filthy and polluted, wasn't as romantic in reality as we had anticipated. The communists had poured everything into it, all sorts of garbage and industrial waste, and neither they nor the Turks cared about environmental protection. Throbzon was lively and active. From the reactions we provoked, stares and excited talk about the bikes, it was clear that few foreigners had been through here recently. At night a cannon went off to signal Iftar, the hour to break the Ramadan fast. The calls to prayer started at four in the morning, the cries clear and haunting in the thin early air. On a trip like this it was impossible to take along much food. When we went into restaurants, naturally the menus were written in Turkish. As usual on these occasions, we used a combination of pidgin English and sign language to ask if we could go into the kitchen. They always said yes. These were big kitchens, as if built in more prosperous times. Usually there was only one stove working, a lot of space, and not much food. The kitchens weren't clean by my mother's standards, but they certainly looked hygienic enough to a hungry traveler. We peered into the pots and pointed. There would always be three or four things, chicken, mutton, maybe duck. We wouldn't eat anything raw. At the refrigerated drink box, we'd point to the bottled water, the soft drinks, or the cold beer. Then we'd go back to the gray, dingy dining room to wait, where we were given slow and curious country stares. The two of us in leather jackets and chaps to protect us from the wind, rain, and spills were like a couple of Martians entering a provincial village. Chapter 7 Old Turkestan with me leading, we headed for that part of the Soviet Union that used to be known as Turkestan. More terrific driving along the Black Sea than our first bad rain day since Europe. As we approached the Georgian border, I decided that if I were a bright young man, I'd come here to the Turkish side and buy up all the land I could find. The map told the whole story. Now that the border was open, the traffic would return to this centuries-old route, and there'd be a boom— Land here was selling for nothing, maybe twenty dollars an acre. Sooner or later this spot would be a major gateway to Europe for the Georgians, Armenians, and Azerbaijanis, who have always been the most prosperous people in the Soviet Union. I didn't buy any land myself, because I invest only in what I believe I'll be able to sell quickly, whether I actually can or not. Besides, this would be work, and I didn't want to work any more. At the Georgian border, cars had to pass over a sunken viewing pit so they could be inspected from below, but we crossed without any trouble. We headed straight for the black market. We rarely had to look far to find it. Usually it found us. As you might expect, it is very profitable to deal in the black markets that existed in any country foolish enough to enforce currency exchange controls. The number of such countries was rapidly diminishing as governments came to realize that such controls didn't work. At that time, the official Soviet exchange rate for travelers was 6 rubles per dollar. On the black market, I got between 12 and 18 rubles, whereas today, you might get 400 times that. This was one reason we carried only a small sum in traveler's checks, but a healthy stock of cash in a variety of hard currencies. Black marketeers don't take traveler's checks. I preferred the slight risk of being robbed by a thief to the certainty of being ripped off by a state bank. We headed across Georgia toward the Central Asian republics, what I still think of as Turkestan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, what romantic names they were, on toward China. Along here I could almost see the vast trains of two-humped Bactrian camels, chosen because they could carry four hundred to five hundred pounds of freight and keep up a killing pace across thousands of miles. I can almost hear the clopping of hooves and the jingle of pack-bells 
The roads weren't good. Narrow with broken pavement, gravel, and small shoulders, even worse than in Turkey, which was pretty damn bad. On a motorcycle, you notice every inch of a roadway, because any bad patch can cause a skid and a spill. You're closer to the road, physically and mentally, than in a car. Still, I'd driven through many countries without good roads, and out in front again, because Tabitha was worried about accidents, I made a certain amount of speed. As we approached Tbilisi, Tabitha again complained I was going too fast. This bothered me. I'm always impatient with delays. I figured we were still in the breaking-in stage of the trip, and from my point of view, things were getting better. On all my trips, I'd rarely had a companion on another bike. Of course, traveling with anybody means living in close quarters, and people rapidly get on each other's nerves. What is one traveler's essential rest stop is another's intolerable delay. From earlier trips, I was used to a certain pace, a certain speed, and when there was no reason to tarry, to me it was normal to drive for eight to ten hours a day and make all the time I could. That way, when I got to an interesting stop, I'd have more time for it. We talked it over and decided it would be better if she led, as then she could set the pace. If the going got rough, she would slow down. Spring arrived. In Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, we saw more evidence of the fall of communism. Statues of Lenin lay toppled in the street, looking bizarre and out of place. To my surprise, here at our first stop in the Soviet Union were state-run liquor stores fully stocked with vodka, wine, champagne, and brandy. Then I remembered the vineyards we had passed. It would be hard to deny the citizens of prosperous Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan the fruits of their own vineyards. These were spirits of excellent quality, too. After all, Churchill himself drank Armenian brandy. In tourist, the Soviet state tourism monopoly was learning to overcharge wildly. A half liter of Stoliknaya in the in tourist hotel was nine dollars, four times as much as in shops in the street. There were lots of new monuments to Georgian heroes. We met some Georgian nationalists, local graduate students. Georgia had always been a hotbed of separatism, we learned. With great pride, they told us their country had been a nation for over 2,000 years. Historically, there were 14 alphabets in the world, they asserted, and the Georgian was one of them. Of course, they had their own calendar. Georgia had always been a trading nation and a crossroads. There was a distinct Georgian form of Christianity that wasn't Russian Orthodox. Stalin had been a Georgian, to their embarrassment. They showed us Stalin's mother's grave. These Georgians felt their country had been stolen by the Russians and tacked onto the Soviet Union, which was true enough. I saw similarities with the way the United States had tacked on Texas, New Mexico, and California, stealing the territories from Mexico. As those parts of the United States become more Latino, and as the United States begins to suffer its inevitable economic decline, I wonder if we won't see the same things ethnic strife and a drive for separatism, either a desire to rejoin Mexico or to be independent. The history of the world tells us that no borders have ever remained stable for long. The United States has been so isolated that we've forgotten this, but if history is any guide, in a hundred years the borders of the United States won't be what they are now. The Georgians were grasping for their roots. Communism had been imposed on them, a religion, a faith that had failed. They were forced into a melting pot they never wanted, and now these students were delirious with joy at the thought of liberation. Churches of all sorts were going up, Muslim and Christian. Becoming a man of the cloth was the area's fastest-growing profession. I was seeing firsthand what I'd always thought, that most people build their identity on religion or nationalism. Of course, I was curious as to whether capitalism was pushing up buds. Only small restaurants had opened, and a few tiny tailor shops, but you could feel the beginning of change. Georgia had always been a merchant area, and of a capitalist bent. We decided to stay here for a few days. This was the rhythm we would develop on this trip, 
to drive till we found something interesting and then stop for some time. Meeting one Georgian led to meeting others, professors, writers, filmmakers, publishers, and minor government officials, who all wanted to talk about the massacre. A year before, in April 1989, there had been a street festival celebrating Georgia's nationhood, a lot of kids out dancing and playing the guitar and serenading, that sort of thing. It was spring, and it had been going on for a few nights. This was not a demonstration, because this crowd wasn't that far advanced politically. This was still a communist, military-controlled state. But the damn local general sent in the tanks at two o'clock in the morning. All these young people dancing in the square, and he sent in the tanks. About fifty were killed. We went home with a publisher, Alex Zaza, who showed us an underground film about the massacre. A Russian filmmaker had been in town and shot the entire thing. People had run every which way, panicked, and tanks rumbled by. We saw an interview with the father of a girl who had been killed by the communist soldiers. He kept saying, What'd they kill her for? My only child. She was a sixteen-year-old girl down there dancing. The filmmaker had even interviewed the general in charge, went to him as if he were a sympathetic interviewer. At the end, he asked, Don't you think this will arouse the people of the Soviet Union and they will get rid of people like you? The general looked stunned, as if he suddenly wondered, Wait a minute, what have I been doing here? The student showed us the memorial in front of the town hall to those who had fallen in the massacre. Fresh flowers had been placed there. This was so risky, so courageous, that it made the hair on my neck rise, as if at any minute the communists would sweep down with more tanks to punish the town for its uppity ways. In an effort to keep up with world affairs, back home I read three newspapers, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times of London, and yet I couldn't remember a line about this bloodbath. Then it hit me. Few outside knew about it. A lot was going on in the Soviet Union that wasn't going to make the Western press, never would, because few from the West ever came to these places. The Times had one or two bureaus in the Soviet Union, in Moscow and maybe Leningrad. Even if it had wanted to send someone, it wasn't easy to travel there, and probably the reporter in Moscow wouldn't have wanted to come to Tbilisi. Besides, the spaces here were so vast, thousands and thousands of miles across, that there weren't enough reporters to cover it all. And, of course, the Russians weren't about to tell anybody they just had a massacre in Tbilisi. The students gave us a copy of the video to smuggle out. Police states and dictators are going to have a hard time in the future. A hundred or even twenty-five years ago, you would have printed your protest or plastered it on the wall with posters. Now an amateur with a video camera can make a wallop of a visual impact. The next morning I was out jogging and puffed my way into the town square, over which rose the big statue of Lenin. I circled it on a look-see. Without warning, the police came out of nowhere and stopped me, pointing guns. I shook my head, not understanding Russian. They gestured at the statue and back at me, their eyes accusatory. They were afraid I was some rabid nationalist intent on destroying the last monument to Lenin in town. In sign language, I gestured and said hotel in Russian, pointing in the direction I hoped it lay. I went jogging off. Still under martial law, this was obviously a hot area. The Russian army told us not to take the main route to Baku, that it might not be safe, and suggested a more scenic way, which I was sure meant even worse roads. We talked it over and decided to ignore their directive and took the main route. We passed a column of twenty friendly tanks, friendly to us anyway, heading east to help occupy Baku, their steel treads wrecking the road's already worn asphalt. The next day, four hundred miles farther on, we rode into Baku, a major center of oil production. All around the road lay rusted pipes and drill rigs, idle, unmaintained, a cluttered junk heap. No wonder Soviet oil production was down communism again. Nobody owned any of this, so nobody took care of it. As long as a manager met his quota, that was fine. 
If meeting his quota meant stripping a few drilling rigs to have six left instead of sixty, he'd do it. He didn't care. This oil field looked like a scrapyard. Under capitalism, the eye of the owner is constantly on a building or a business, or he loses it. Not the case here. This was one of the reasons the Soviets never built their capital base, because they'd never built any capital. Riding along the Caspian Sea, we saw hundreds of these discarded drilling rigs, all stripped. Nobody maintained the pressure in the wells. Back home, you maintained them because you wanted the extra 50% from a well. Here, they took the oil off the top and left it. They were doing what they accused the capitalists of, skimming off the easy money and running. Capitalists would have maintained these wells till they ran dry. Otherwise, they'd be bankrupt capitalists. We pulled into Baku, where there had been a gigantic massacre three months before in January. Three hundred to four hundred people had been killed, but this time it had been Christian Armenians slaughtered by Muslim Azerbaijanis. Baku was still under martial law. Lots of Soviet personnel carriers, the army strongly in evidence, even though all the Armenians had left Baku since the killings. My thesis about ethnic strife in the Soviet Union was unfolding before my eyes. Few Americans knew about the massacre, even though Baku is one of the largest cities in the Soviet Union, the heart of its major oil-producing region. It was down here on the Caspian Sea, where Western reporters didn't come much. A large portion of Baku's population had been Armenian, but two months before we arrived, they had returned to Armenia. They wouldn't sit here and be slaughtered any more. The mobs had even ripped down the statue of the Armenian's best poet, their Shakespeare, from the outside wall of the main library, leaving a blank space. One ethnic group didn't want the heroes of another group to stand. When things go wrong on a macroeconomic level, it's almost always this way. People find someone to blame, whether it's the blacks, whites, Christians, Jews, Muslims, whoever, especially if there's a successful minority like the German Jews in the 1930s. Baku was under such tight martial law that we couldn't even find a restaurant open at night. We crossed the Caspian by ferry to Krasnovatsk. This put us on the eastern, desert side of the sea. In contrast, the western side had been wet and fertile. Out here, too, the region was shifting, changing. Uzbeks against Machete Turks. Uzbeks and Kyrgyz fighting in Ash. There had been clashes in Samarkand in 1988, and in Tashkent, Askabad, and Novya Uzen in 1989. Some of the skirmishes had been against the Russians, but much of this had been tribe against tribe, one ethnic group attacking another. The usual reasons were all around us. Not only eco-catastrophe, but Islamic fundamentalism and plain old bigotry plus all the usual economic reasons, a shortage of land, appalling living conditions, and a lack of jobs. Growing seasonal cotton meant that for much of the year, the local men had no work. What a fascinating part of the world. Back in the early days of communism, this had been known as the Virgin Lands. The bright young men of that time had come down here to make their way in agriculture. They had to irrigate to grow crops in the deserts, so they'd use the Aral Sea for water. Khrushchev had been one of those bright young men, and he and his crew irrigated much of the Karakum Desert. Kazakhstan had become a gigantic farmland, a desert that had bloomed into vast arable tracts. The Russians had piled in here. The area became 40% Russian, or as before, it had been all Muslim and Turkic. Khrushchev had come down here to make his fortune. Brezhnev had been here too, under Khrushchev, which had given him his big chance. For them, this had been the California gold rush. If they could succeed, their fortunes under the communist system would be made. In the same way that Ronald Reagan, from the golden state of California, could become president of the United States, these fellows would hail from a golden part of their world one they had transformed into the promised land. By the time they were done, Uzbekistan was producing 67% of the USSR's cotton.
Kazakhstan was producing a huge proportion of its wheat. This farming miracle, however, has required vast amounts of water as well as herbicides and insecticides, which are said to be used in this region at 25 times the national rate. The result, after all the years of draining, cultivation, and fertilizing, has been one of the world's largest environmental disasters. Khrushchev and his crew used two-thirds of the water of the Aral Sea for irrigation, and much of the land has been poisoned by sea salt. Flowing north to the Arctic, as do all rivers in Siberia, the Aral Sea used to provide 13% of all the fish in the Soviet Union. Now not a fish in it is alive. The river water and groundwater were salty and contaminated. Rates of birth defects and infant mortality in the region were among the world's highest. Fishing villages, once at the edge of the Aral Sea, are now 30 miles away, surrounded by dry land. Here was the result of bureaucracy and arrogance run amok. The Russians had thought they could use the water to turn the area into a cotton plantation. But they had treated the land the way they treated the oil fields we had passed. They stripped it and moved on. In the United States, if you were to go out and buy a 100,000 square miles of farmland and then go to the bank and get several billion dollars to cultivate it, sooner or later even a banker would say, Whoa, this ain't working. We're not going to go on throwing money at this. It'll collapse. There would be some discipline, but not in communism. You could ruin a resource by gutting it without anyone saying, Halt. China had the same problem back in the 60s and 70s, when after centuries of self-sufficiency, it became a net importer of cotton. In the late 70s, the Chinese government finally admitted its way wasn't working. It deregulated agriculture, turning it over to the peasants. It allowed farmers to lease land for a long time, and in some places, actually to buy it. Since direction from the top wasn't working, and communes weren't working, the people in the countryside were allowed to do whatever they wanted. Just as important, the government didn't insist that farmers sell their corn and cotton to the state at some artificially low price, but allowed them to sell it for what they could get on the world market. The farmers went wild. That's one reason China is so capitalistic right now. Within five years, these farmers began to export cotton. China also went from importing to being a major exporter of grain. When I rode through there in 1986 and 1988, I noticed that every field was planted and cultivated, every item reused, nothing wasted. The farmers didn't strip the land. It was theirs, and they had to plant it next year and the year after that. In Russia, however, the land was nobody's, and it didn't matter. Next year we'll move on to the next acre, the thinking went, and we'll get some more water, and who cares? If I'm a commissioner, I'll make my grain quotas for ten years so I'll be promoted to Moscow. Of course, many, many of these agriculture commissars were lying. The local party chief, Sharaf Rashidov, was famous for inflating the cotton harvest in the 70s and 80s, but he wasn't the only one. None of the officials were producing their quotas, but they said they were. They were faking it, just lying, and there were no accountants, no checking, no bankers, no accountability. As long as the cotton factories got cotton, they didn't know or care. It was none of their business. This is one of the primary things wrong with communism. No accountability, no responsibility, no incentive. As we drove through town after town, and these scenes were repeated, it dawned on me that the Soviet Union had fallen apart. The idea was startling. This was mid-1990, and the coup wouldn't come for another year. The Soviet Union looked like nothing more than a third-world country with a big army and a space program. Nothing seemed to work here. Though much of what we saw was new, everything got old and seedy the minute it was built. Most of the hotels we stayed in, unlike the rare in-tourist places for travelers, looked like bomb sites, busted elevators, broken plumbing, no soap, no towels, no toilet paper, not even toilet seats. Only for foreigners did the Soviets provide clean linens, but you always had to make your own bed, comrade. The other thing Tabitha and I noticed throughout the Central Asian republics were the number of Muslims. 
In America, we tend to think Muslims are a people centered in the Middle East, not realizing that they run from Morocco to the Philippines, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. There are as many Muslims in the world as there are Christians. The fourth largest country in the world is Indonesia, and it's Muslim. There's Pakistan, and then Bangladesh with more than 100 million people. India alone has something like 90 million Muslims, a population which, if spun off into an independent country, would be the 11th largest in the world. In the USSR, 15% of the population was Muslim, and they weren't happy being dominated by Russians. With Tabitha still leading, we moved on through the Karakum Desert, which was huge. It stretched hundreds of miles from the Caspian Sea, across Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, to Samarkand. I'd been in other deserts, in the American Southwest and across the Taklamakan Desert in China, but this one was plainer, simpler, scrubbier. Here, too, we ran into farmland, which I rarely did in other deserts. Tabitha's bike had constant mechanical problems, which caused both of us to pay almost as much attention to it as to the countryside. I hoped this wouldn't take too much out of her, but she was becoming apprehensive about completing the trip. In this region, gas cost 40 kopecks per liter. A gallon was about 15 cents at black market rates, 30 cents at bank rates. Every now and then we'd cross the Karakum Canal, 50 yards wide, full of muddy water, part of the irrigation system the Russians had set up. In a capitalist country, there wouldn't have been all that dirt in the water, because it meant you were losing land, and no capitalist was going to let his land get eroded. We also ran into scores and scores of wild camels, as well as signs that warned, beware of wild camels, just as in the States road signs warned of deer crossings. Finally, we reached Bukhara, where we were laid low and made wretched by food poisoning. At the hospital, the doctor asked if we had any medicine. No, that's why we came here, I told him. We don't have any medicine, he said. Maybe you should call an ambulance. I felt dizzy, confused. But I'm already here at the hospital, I said. Why would I need an ambulance? Maybe they have some medicine, he said. Dumbfounded, we left and treated ourselves with the patent remedies we'd brought with us. A day later, we were better, well, but tired. Tabitha was enthusiastic about Bukhara. Recalling her academic studies, she explained that it had been one of Central Asia's great early cities. Here there were lots of domes and minarets, the first signs of power and money we'd seen for a long time. We went to the Soviet May Day Parade, which involved long exhortations by political brass and a couple hours of paraders passing the reviewing stand. Red banners were everywhere, thousands and thousands of them. If the Soviets had put their banner facilities to work making cloth, they could have exported clothes. We drove on to Samarkand, one of the world's most ancient cities and the oldest of Central Asia. Although outside its graceful old world center, Samarkand was no more than the usual colorless Soviet city, burdened by polluted air and traffic congestion, the ruins at its core dated back to between 3000 B.C. and 4000 B.C., after conquest by Alexander the Great, the city became a meeting point of Western and Chinese cultures. It reached its greatest splendor as the capital of Tamerlane's empire in the 14th century, when the Turkic conqueror also made it Central Asia's cultural epicenter. In the 18th century, the city fell into decline, but it was later brought back to life by the Transcaspian Railway. Despite its communist yoke, Samarkand seemed to be the most prosperous city we had come across since Baku, a thousand miles back. In its bustling market we found good produce, including fresh cloves with an intoxicating fragrance that delighted Tabitha. We learned that few travelers came to Samarkand. The centerpiece of the city's ancient splendor is the Registron, an ensemble of three mandrasas, or Islamic schools. Majestic in their soaring lines and cobalt-blue mosaics, they made us gape at their beauty, for these magnificent schools are a sight as breathtaking as the Taj Mahal. There are a few things in the world that should never be photographed, 
because pictures cannot do them justice. The Taj Mahal and Samarkand are two that should be seen only in person. Under the corner domes of the Ulig Bek Madrasa, completed in 1420, were lecture halls, and in its rear was a mosque. The Tiger Madrasa flouted the Islamic injunction against showing pictures of live animals by boldly displaying glorious tilework devoted to its namesake. Between these two was the Gold Madrasa, inside which lay an impressive broad courtyard. Drinking in all this splendor, I remembered that as recently as a hundred years before, the Taj Mahal itself had just sat there, abandoned. Nobody went there. Nobody cared. Some travelers stumbled upon it, started publicizing it, and now it's one of the great wonders of the world. But a hundred years before, you could have bought it for five hundred dollars, the whole damn thing. Samarkand was like the Taj Mahal in that way, if not even more extraordinary. I believe somebody was going to make a fortune opening a Hilton here, because once informed, people would stream to this city the way they streamed to the Taj Mahal. Dusty Samarkand is a delicacy just sitting out there waiting to be discovered, a comely backcountry farmer's daughter not yet discovered by prosperous city suitors. These resurgent Islamic schools around the square were part of a developing pattern. For decades there had been only one madrasa in all of the Soviet Union, and now they were opening everywhere. Every time we turned around in this part of the world, in Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, or Uzbekistan, a new school was opening up, an Islamic school. We discovered that 40 mosques had opened in Uzbekistan alone in 1989, and at least one was being built in every town we passed through. Ashgabad, Mary, Bukhara. The culture was shifting, too. One night in Jambul, we went out to a restaurant with a lot of outdoor tables, it didn't have a wine list, and we asked the owner if we could bring our own. He shrugged. Why not? We went back to the hotel and bought a bottle of wine and came back to our table. We put the wine on the table and had dinner. About three quarters through our meal, the manager came out screaming, Get that goddamn wine out of here! You can't come in here and drink! Putting it right on the table was a big faux pas. We really were in a center of Islam which forbids alcohol, and this in the belly of the Soviet Union. Muslim people, Muslim monuments, Muslim schools, Muslim customs. Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, was more evidence of the vitality of these Muslim regions. A modern, glistening city, it had a major international airport and first-class hotels. Over the previous twenty years, this regional capital had blossomed the way Los Angeles and Atlanta had in the United States, becoming the Soviet Union's fourth-largest city. The closer we got to Alma-Ata and the Chinese border, the more signs of ethnic unrest we saw. Central Asia is a huge melting pot of Turkic and Persian ethnic groups. Many are Muslims with strong ties to Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Xinjiang, the Chinese province. At this point, the newcomers, the Russians, outnumbered the Muslims in some areas, but the Muslims were multiplying at a furious rate, and to me, the handwriting was on the wall. We tend not to understand that a large part of Western history over the past 1,300 or 1,400 years has been Muslims against Christians. The Crusades, the Gates of Constantinople, the Spanish Inquisition— the Muslims were always trying to come into Europe through Austria, through Hungary, through Spain. The Christians beat them back several times. During the centuries of the Dark Ages in Europe, the Muslims were much more dynamic than the Christians. They expanded geographically, spreading their culture and religion from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In fact, if the Europeans hadn't come to the New World, hadn't brought Christianity to it long before anybody ever gave a hoot about the Western Hemisphere, the number of Christians today probably wouldn't even come close to the number of Muslims. They're not over yet, these global battles. It may not be communism versus capitalism next time. One of the thrusts of the future could well be the revival of Islam versus Christianity. All the Muslim areas are resurgent, not so much because they want to be Islamic, but because they need a vehicle to help them get more. 
If people are prosperous, they tend not to fight. What they're reaching out for is Islam, the only unifying thread they have to help them achieve their own prosperity and identity. As these Muslims move toward autonomy, clashes will occur, because the Muslims won't be able to blame their problems on the communists anymore. They've all been swept out. They'll blame them on the Christians, for lack of a better scapegoat. The Soviet Union, with its 128 different ethnic, national, language, and religious groups, struck me as many civil wars waiting to happen. The economy would continue to collapse, and politicians always need somebody to blame. All these groups were going to be at each other's throats, and the Union would keep fragmenting into smaller and smaller pieces. There might be, say, fifty states, a hundred states before it was done. The USSR was one of the largest empires the world has ever seen, or ever will see, both in terms of area and peoples. It was put together by force of arms, and still contains many discontented people. When a political entity of such vastness comes apart, the process continues for years, even decades. Our journalists and bureaucrats thought the USSR would take only a year or two to dismantle, that after a little transition things would be okay. This isn't the way history works. Witness the slow breakups of the Roman, Turkish, Ottoman, Chinese, Spanish, and British empires, and the aftershocks and reverberations that lingered for many decades after their demise. Will these conflicts be dangerous to the United States? or to our trading partners in Western Europe? Do we need to continue to spend $150 billion to defend our allies against the threat from the former Soviet Union? No. First, many of the previously much-feared Soviet weapons were junk from the start. We often saw broken-down missile launchers just sitting alongside the road. Vast numbers of trucks, tanks, and other mobile vehicles have been scavenged and their parts have been used for myriad purposes in the private sector. Yes, there are still weapons, but large numbers of them do not work anymore. Second, most of the remaining armaments will be used in the local civil and guerrilla wars that will be common in the former Soviet Union for years to come. The various warlords are going to have their hands full, fending off encroachments and attacks from other warlords. There have been constant local wars in this area since before the days of Genghis Khan, and nothing's changed. But this warfare will have little or no effect on us, unless some meddling politician feels he has to make something of it. Some of the remaining weapons will be sold in the international armaments market. This is not a big change. There has been a vast global trade in arms for decades, nay centuries. For a while, there will also be the deterrent effects of Saddam Hussein's failure in Kuwait. None of these areas will provoke the combined interests of the developed world, even if they had the military capacity, which they don't and won't. The Soviet Union is actually headed toward a system that will resemble feudalism, the economic, political, and social system of medieval Europe, after the breakup of the Roman Empire, in which there were innumerable and ever-changing fiefdoms. VE Day in Alma-Ata was still a major holiday, with parades, military displays, hundreds of banners, and lots of propaganda about World War II, all part of the effort to build up the image of the Communist Party and the state. Lots of new buildings and heroic monuments, including, of course, the ubiquitous monument to the Soviet World War II dead. One-sixth of the Russian population, about 25 million people, had died defending Mother Russia from Hitler. The battle for Stalingrad alone had cost the lives of a million Soviet troops. Awesome statistics. If the United States today were to suffer a similar loss, 45 million of us would perish defending our country. The war was the only thing the communists had ever done right, and they never tired of celebrating it. The Soviets had won the war, but they hadn't done anything since. Communism would have collapsed sooner if it hadn't been for the Second World War, and they knew it. As part of their ongoing propaganda movement, in every Soviet town stood a heroic monument to the war effort, often a single piece of granite twenty yards high and wide, along with an entire park of marble soldiers and workers battling fascists. Everywhere an eternal flame. God knew what the Soviet Union was spending on eternal flames. 
When a bride got married, she would go to the eternal flame and honor the war dead with flowers. Sure, you expected such monuments in Washington or Moscow, capital cities, but out here, every little town had one. They were about the only things that were maintained. If the communists had spent all the money on roads that they spent on monuments to Lenin in the Second World War, they would have had a hell of a road system by now. It reminded me of the war between the states here at home. Until 1914, the largest traveler's attraction in America was Grant's tomb. Aging soldiers and their relatives kept visiting it, reliving their youth, their nostalgia, their glory, even though the war had been over for fifty years. Tabitha and I had seen a few old guys wearing medals in many places in the USSR, but on the big day itself everybody came out in full regalia. We came across several people who were falling down drunk. We tried to help some, even called the police, who came because it was the exotic Americans who wanted them, but they would say, oh hell, it's just another drunk on V.E. Day. And everywhere there were babushkas, sweeping, doing laundry, selling little plates of onions, tomatoes, and meat in the market. They were widows from the war, left by an entire generation of lost husbands. Chapter 8 China By now we'd racked up 6,000 miles and were making steady progress. From Alma-Ata in Kazakhstan, we approached the Chinese border. I had driven across China two years before, a year before Tiananmen Square, and I'd had a spectacularly delightful time. I wondered how much the country had changed. I had read the American press on the troubles, but I knew they wouldn't get it right. Describing the surface usually with little training in history or economics and none in geography, journalists rarely understand what goes on inside foreign countries. From my previous trips, I had a grounding in recent Chinese history that was at variance with the ideas parroted endlessly by the Western press. I also knew the Chinese were now understandably nervous about foreign opinion in general and foreign visitors in particular, so I wasn't sure how we'd be received. Earlier in the 80s, the Chinese had been happily becoming capitalists. Out in the countryside, everybody was building houses. People in the cities were complaining because prices were going up. So the government gave bonuses to the city folk, which it paid for by printing money. Needless to say, this caused terrible inflation, a boom-bust bubble that soon got out of control. Finally, the government cracked down on the money supply. As I said earlier, revolutions don't come from oppressed people. They come from folks whose expectations have been aroused. By early 1989, China's harsh new monetary policy began to cause hard times. Several months later, people surged into Tiananmen Square to bitch about tight money. Then students, who didn't know any better, transformed a complaint about a slow-moving economy and monetary policy into a cry for democracy. Most Chinese weren't all that interested in democracy. They mainly wanted to get rich, like most people everywhere. Marx was right about one thing. Money is the root of everything. If you figure out the money, you can figure out almost any political situation. Most everything else Marx got wrong. Look at what caused the Boston Massacre. The Boston economy had gone to hell in the early 1770s, with the unemployment rate at more than 30%. America's revolutionaries transformed a protest against unemployment into the higher moral ground of no taxation without representation. So the Chinese sent their troops into Tiananmen Square, a minor blip in the vast panorama of Chinese history, but a world-shaking event to foreign reporters. The outcry in the Western media so panicked the Chinese government that by 1990 this freewheeling country was a horribly stifling place to visit. The government didn't want travelers to come away with any negative impressions, so the best thing to do was keep them from seeing much. From the Chinese perspective, though, things were improving. Not only did I find some of my entrepreneur friends whom I had met on previous rides still very much in business, but monetary and fiscal policies had gotten looser, and the economy was starting to pick up. Everywhere on my trips through China I've seen signs that the sleeping dragon has awakened. It was a country in the grip of statism that was now throwing off its yoke. 
Few Chinese any longer believe that the government has the answers to their economic problems. Like successful entrepreneurs in many parts of the world, Chinese entrepreneurs are bringing every scrap of energy, money, and technology they can marshal into their businesses. Two decades from now, they are going to be among the best capitalists in the world. They may still call themselves communists, but I promise you, they will run circles around most of us. In the South, they're already achieving great prosperity. We have the usual confusion that results from crossing a border that sees few travelers. This border had only recently been opened. The officials here had never seen visas or carnets. No one wanted to change dollars into Chinese currency. Although we both had international driver's licenses, the Chinese weren't sure if they should accept them or even our international vaccination certificates. We got in. At once there were lots of people around, many more than I'd expected. I concluded that the national government encouraged the Han, the country's major ethnic group, to move out west, both to provide a buffer from the Soviet Union's military adventures and to dilute the predominant Muslim population. We drove into Yining, the big border city. The so-called luxury hotel we stayed in had just been finished, and it seemed to be benefiting from transborder traffic. There was lots of beer, but no more vodka. Two years previously, I had noticed that every Chinese town was building a tourist hotel, often spending lavishly on luxurious palaces that made me wonder who would ever rent them. These hotels were part of the wild inflationary boom of 1988 and 1989, which was a forerunner of Tiananmen Square. Now the central government was telling the towns that they had to stop building these stupid hotels, that it wouldn't pay for them anymore. The local party cadre across China had built fancy hotels and office buildings the way the Soviet communists had built monuments in the heroic style to the Second World War effort in every town, as status symbols trophies, not on any economic basis. I was worried about the road through the Taklamakan Desert, because it had been such a disaster when I had driven through in 1988. That was the 500-mile stretch from Turpan East that I'd described to Tabitha, the worst motorcycle nightmare of my life, a constant struggle over sand dunes, rocks, hills, falling down, getting stuck, digging my way out. We had to go through Hami, a town right smack in the center of it all. I hoped Tabitha would be all right. Hell, I hoped I would be all right. Picking our way along the mountainous road, we saw strange dark objects, tents or yurts, made from what appeared to be the skins of goats and bears. We pulled over and stared. Silence, except for the occasional bleat of a goat. A shy little girl with big eyes and a long skirt stared at us. The yurts made sense for these tribesmen, the Uyghurs, because they could be dismantled in a hurry and packed on a camel. The little girl was five or six and had an older sister, eight or so. We gave them some bread and they looked back over at their mother and the latest baby, mutely asking if they might take it. After she nodded, they took the bread and ran back to her. We went over. In the usual combination of sign language and simple English, we asked if we could look inside the yurt, which was fine with her. At first glance, the inside appeared bare, but that was only to a western eye, expecting the clutter of furniture. Along one wall, a small cloth-covered table held clean pots and crockery, and hanging from the ceiling was an embroidered, flower-decorated white cloth that could be dropped to divide the inner space. A kettle stood on the bare ground beside a dark purple rug. Several pallets were turned against the wall to serve as backrests. There was a pile of skins, too. After all, this was a cold climate much of the year. They needed them. I wondered why I had seen so few of the nomadic Uyghurs on both trips, and then it hit me. Like the Eskimos, they were disappearing because of technology in the march of the 20th century. The Chinese were busily building a road from Urumqi south to Pakistan and another from Urumqi to the Soviet Union. Many of the Uyghurs either worked on these roads or had regular jobs maintaining them. The new roads also allowed tribesmen to get regular work in the cities. Thus, there were fewer nomads 
and fewer cashmere goats, and as a result, cashmere has become almost prohibitively expensive in New York. An entire culture might be destroyed because of the roads. This is how man's world is, constantly shifting, constantly changing everything around, opening opportunities for some and closing them for others, just like Mother Nature herself, and those who don't accept it will find themselves swimming against a powerful flood. I know all the arguments of how we must stop the boot heel of progress, how we must preserve the way things were in the good old days. I'm not convinced there ever were any good old days. There are those, not me, who would look at this woman and say, This is terrible. We shouldn't destroy these people, this culture, this way of life by tempting them with road work. Just as we've been told we shouldn't destroy the Eskimos. I wonder what the Eskimos and Uyghurs would say. They certainly didn't have to stop being nomads because work in towns and cities opened up. I looked at this woman's life in these glorious yet windswept and desolate mountains and said to Tabitha, Boy, I'd be glad the road came to town and I could go and do other things. I remembered how happy we'd been back in Demopolis when they finally paved the streets. Apparently most Uyghurs agree with me. That this road building had driven up the price of cashmere intrigued me. Here was an example of how an investor has to think. If they're putting in a big road in Pakistan and China, it has to have an effect somewhere. Every time an investor sees a big change coming, he has to start thinking, okay, what does this mean? Where does it lead? What are going to be the economic, political, and social shifts because of it? And won't the new railroad to the USSR intensify these effects? Well, in 30 years, most of the yurts are going to be gone, with the owners of those left charging $40 a visit. They'll fix them up with a bed and indoor plumbing and charge you a fortune to have a genuine nomadic experience. Plus, you'll pay more for cashmere. When I called my office, I had them stockpile two or three cashmere sweaters for my return. But these would only be the beginning, only the superficial changes. Spring was turning into summer. We drove from Yuning over the mountains to the city of Shihezi in Xinjiang province, a pretty drive but with patches of bad road. This western province was a sixth of the size of the continental United States, but it had only 15 million people. Compared with China's population of 1.2 billion, this was nothing. The next day we reached Urumqi, still a big growing modern city. The railroad to the USSR was just about finished, which would help the region prosper. Out here we feasted on roasted sheep, mutton shashlik, pilafs, and steamed mutton dumplings. Street vendors offered us cow bauzi, packets of baked bread dough stuffed with mutton and onions, as well as steaming mutton soups, dumplings stuffed with mutton and herbs, and rice pilafs with apricots, mutton, onions, and carrots. Boiled noodles with a side of sautéed mutton, onions, tomatoes, and green peppers was a popular dish. Delicious. Of course, I learned to say beer in Chinese. In fact, after this trip, I can say beer in 40 languages. To my delight, I learned that the Dunhuang Urumqi Highway was completed. That old northern route that had given me such nightmarish trouble on my last trip was a thing of the past. As I traced out on my map the recent development of highways and railroads through this desolate part of the world, which I still thought of as Turkestan, I saw it was going to be transformed by its new infrastructure. The ancient silk roads, once mountain trails fit only for camels, were being replaced by those suitable for long-haul trucks and the iron horse. This vast area, bounded east and west by the Caspian Sea and the Taklamakan Desert, by the Himalayas to the south and the Kyrgyz steppes to the north, would become prosperous. Trade, tourism, and their resulting opportunities would create dozens of ways for sharp-eyed entrepreneurs to become rich. Why hadn't it happened before? Back in the 50s, the Chinese and the Russians had been pals, and spying the opportunities here, part of their military, political, and economic alliance had been to develop an infrastructure to link the two countries. They'd set out to extend the Chinese railroad through Xinjiang province to connect up with the Soviet presence in Turkestan and onward to Europe. Then they'd had a spat, and the railroad was never finished beyond Urumqi.
When India went to war with China in the early 60s, it had become allies with the USSR against their new common enemy. To maintain the balance of power, China had aligned itself with Pakistan. Naturally, China and Pakistan needed road transportation in the event that either would have to rush in troops and materials to prevent an invasion from the other axis. The Karakoram Highway, linking Urumqi, Kashgar, and Islamabad, this 700-mile joint project of Pakistan and China, that also had been interrupted by political tiffs, was finally finished. Not only had these projects given local workers jobs, but they would now bring in tourism and commerce. Tribesmen were romantic nomads before because they had little else to do. Now they would have a choice. Before this southern route was finished, it had been one of the worst driving experiences in the world, less a road than a river of broken boulders tumbling across the mountains. Its completion was a tribute to man's courage and ingenuity. Part of the route was blasted out of sheer rock faces over deep canyons of the Indus River. In many places, workers had to hang suspended by ropes to drill holes for dynamite. More than 400 men had lost their lives building it, and now small cairns marked their graves. It had been dangerous to build, and was still dangerous to drive on, for rock slides and flash floods were a constant threat. On their side of the border, the Pakistanis deployed 10,000 soldiers just for road maintenance and emergency clearance. Now the railroad was being completed from both sides of its northern route by the Chinese and Russians, which would link this area to Alma-Ata and Kazakhstan, and from there to anywhere west, Istanbul, Moscow, London. Turkestan would be open to the outside world in every direction, north, east, south, and west, after centuries of isolation brought on by primitive communication and transportation. I knew that as apparently simple as this railroad and these two new Chinese roads were, they would have major ramifications for the political, economic, social, and historical future of not only Asia, but the entire world beyond. Now we drove through real desert, dunes and distant mountains, into Turpan and the Turpan Depression, the lowest dry land in the world. Turpan was a weaker town with Muslim mosques and domes, non-Chinese in many ways. While it was hot and dry, thankfully it was May and not August. In this desert, the winds were more ferocious than I'd experienced in any setting, especially on a motorcycle. Last time through, I'd had to constantly fight to keep my motorcycle upright. Once I'd parked on the asphalt, and a gust had knocked over my 500-pound machine. I remember watching a woman in a passenger car unlock her door over and over in her struggle to open it, unaware that the powerful wind had kept the door jammed shut. What amazed me on both trips through several thousand miles after leaving the border of western China was the lack of people. Nowhere can you go a hundred yards in eastern China without seeing someone, but out here, eighty or ninety miles inside the western border and on the other side of the hills, we drove scores of miles without seeing anybody. It was startling, too, that the cultivated portion of the desert here was greener than on the Russian side, and we soon discovered why. Not only were the Chinese better organized, they had devised a clever system of irrigation tunnels beneath the desert that drew water from the mountains to augment the natural oases they'd built their cities around. Hundreds of years old, these tunnels kept the loss from evaporation to a minimum. I was stupefied, stunned, that the Chinese had not only run them for hundreds of miles, but had done so for centuries. In the towns, sluice gates, irrigation ditches, and intricate valve systems sent water when and where they wanted it. They even watered down the roads every morning to reduce dust. With a system that survives to this day, the ancient Chinese had cleverly turned straggly desert oases into prosperous towns surrounded by fertile fields. This Chinese ingenuity and conservation contrasted sharply with the Russian use of the Aral Sea over the past few decades. The Chinese had turned the same countryside into a garden that the Russians had turned into an eco-catastrophe. I wasn't surprised to learn that the Chinese were the first to increase crop productivity by planting in rows instead of scattering seed around. A lot of the Chinese success had to do with economic and political organization. The Russians had set into action a system without accountability, and were quickly reaping what they had sown. 
The Chinese had nowhere to go. No frontier, no Siberia, no virgin lands, no conquered territory. So they made do with what they had. They reminded me of societies of hunters, such as the Eskimos and other Native Americans, who lived in harmony with nature because they knew if they killed off the animals, that was it. Some Chinese farmers were so skillful they got three crops a year. They planted right to the edge of the road, using every square inch of land. They fertilized their soil. They rotated crops. They did everything that had to be done to make the land work well for them. In Turpan, while we were having a new head gasket made for Tabitha's bike, I went to the market, an outdoor bazaar. It had beautiful melons, not at all what you'd expect in the middle of the desert, another tribute to the Chinese skill with water management. We needed local cash, so I hunted up the black market in currency. Wherever there are exchange controls, as there are in China, there's a currency black market. I find such markets, capitalism in the raw, fascinating, because if there's one quick and sure way for an investor or a traveler to find out what's going on in a country, this is it. The price of the currency is to the prudent investor what an X-ray is to an experienced radiologist. The premium over the bank, or official rate, gives me my most important clue as to what the government is up to. If I can buy five Zlotties for a dollar at the bank, but I can get eight on the black market, it tells me the government is trying to foist its currency on its own people, that it's afraid to let it float on the world market. Even without asking, I know if a country has currency controls, import taxes, and probably export restrictions. Governments think exchange controls keep money in their country, but they keep it out. If the currency is freely convertible, outsiders will bring money in, and insiders won't be in a desperate struggle to smuggle it out, which they always are if the currency isn't convertible. Certainly the last place you or I want to put our money is some place where we can't get it out. So many other investors feel the same way, that no one will come in with or behind us to bull up the market. This simple test often tells me whether to bother exploring a country further for investment. If the rate on the black market is five and a half slotties to the dollar, compared with the state bank's rate of five, then things might not be so bad. But if it is ten or fifteen to the dollar, then I know the country is in terrible shape, with maybe the collapse of the government or hyperinflation on the horizon. It spells trouble for everybody, massive instability. Most travelers have a vague understanding that the ups and downs of a currency are an indication of the health of a country, much the way the rise and fall of a stock price discloses the problems and strengths of a company. What they don't realize is that in the same way company presidents and treasurers try to bull up the price of a stock, a country's treasury secretary and finance ministers stay up nights doing the same thing. Smart finance ministers know that gimmicks, restrictions, and regulations won't attract foreign capital to be invested in their country over the long run. They strive to inspire confidence by creating sound value. The dumb ones put on endless restrictions and can't understand why no one wants their currencies. I want to trade dollars, I said to the runner, who was about 16, just a trainee. His limit was $10, so I asked him to take me to his boss. Now I was on my guard. As you travel, you hear stories of hustles by currency traders on the black market. But as usual, I felt better taking my chances with them than with the state bank, which I knew would rob me with its artificial exchange rates. If I kept my wits about me, at least with the black marketeers, I had a chance for a fair deal. One favorite trick is the sleight of hand shift. One traveler told me he had carefully counted the bills he was given, never allowed his new stash to leave his hand, and yet he had found he possessed a stack of carefully cut newspaper on his return to his hotel. Another trick is the engineered danger. The police, they cry, as they disappear into the crowd with your side of the transaction, or you're hurriedly handed a wad of bills that are mostly blank paper. Always agree on a price first, count what you are given next, make sure it doesn't leave your hand, and only then fork over what's due. After all, you're buying merchandise, even if it is money, and you should examine your purchase before accepting it, a sensible custom that holds true worldwide.
In fact, to prevent having counterfeit bills foisted on us, we often bought a few dollars worth of currency as samples from the state bank before we hiked over to the black market for the bulk of our purchases. If someone mutters police, either hand back what you're holding or coolly walk away with it. The black market is guaranteed to find you again. The yard boss was at the market's entrance, keeping an eye on his runners. He was Turkic, about twenty-four. The black market is a young man's game, to judge by the guys I've met on the front lines. But for all I knew, there was a middle-aged guy upstairs with an account in Switzerland. The pockets of the Turkic yard boss's jacket were stuffed with big wads of Japanese yen, Chinese renminbi, and U.S. greenbacks. He pulled them out in a circumspect manner, as this was illegal. All this furtiveness reminded me of buying moonshine back in Alabama, another transaction in which vendors had to dodge the Federal's efforts to skim a share of the proceeds. How many renminbi for a dollar? I asked in sign language in primitive English. The demographers tell us half the world's people speak some English, and from the evidence we accumulated on this trip, I'd say they're right. He had no trouble understanding me. He offered me five, and I said no because I'd heard I could get eight. The rate wasn't as good as when I'd come through two years before, back when they had had all that inflation. Then I had received six for a dollar, when the official rate was four, a 50% premium. He told me that back then the Chinese people were paying up for foreign currencies, wanting out of their own money because it was falling fast in value as distrusted by the natives as the pound sterling and the lira were, later in England and Italy. This time I got only a 35% premium. The only currencies the yard boss was interested in buying were dollars and yen. He wouldn't take sterling or Deutschmarks. After all, this was the middle of the Taklamakan Desert, thousands of miles from any trading center. I guessed he wanted these two because the dollar had been a reserve currency for a long time and Japan did a huge trade business with China. After horsing around, we settled on seven to the dollar. He actually gave me too much for the dollar compared with the yen, so I was tempted to swap my dollars for yen. With my more up-to-date knowledge of the international currency markets, I could have made a nice little arbitrage profit because I knew what the market was and he didn't. The Dow Jones ticker hadn't arrived in Turpan. Give it another couple of years. On the road to Hami, Tabitha developed a hole in her piston. This bike had done everything to us but lie down and die, and I had the feeling that that was near. It was a hole the size of a dime, and here we were, in a country as large as the United States without a single dealer who sold BMW parts. We threw her bike into the back of a trunk we flagged down, halted into Hami, and began asking endless questions. Finally, we were lucky enough to find a mechanic who stayed up till 4.30 in the morning welding the hole. It had to be done carefully, with Tabitha supervising the work, built up thin layer by thin layer so it wouldn't blow out at a critical time. Here was where it really paid to have brought along a trained mechanic, someone who understood what she was doing. We didn't know if it would work, but there was no way to get a spare BMW part into the middle of the Taklamakan Desert. This is the kind of repair you make in the backwoods of China, Africa, and South America. It would cause a factory-certified mechanic to shudder. God knew what it would do to the long-term health of the engine, but there was no way to get out of here but to try it. We poked around a little. Ami itself was still the isolated desert town I remembered, although it looked a bit more prosperous. I still dreaded the drive to Dunhuang, since last time it had taken me 17 hours to cover the 250 miles. We set out, worried about the jury-rigged piston. Still leading, Tabitha had to watch for potholes and traffic, and yet we couldn't help but keep our ears tuned to every thump and rattle coming from her engine. We kept moving, one mile, five... Twenty? Forty? It was working. Maybe it would hold till we got to Japan. As we edged across the desert, afraid to strain the engine, what struck me was the vastness of western China. How strange it looked. How un-Chinese. Here was China, with more people than any other country in the world. And where were they? Imagine that the United States had five times its present population, and that we all lived east of the Mississippi. China is that dramatic.
Imagine what the eastern half of the United States would be like if it were eight times as populated as it is now. Imagine the living conditions, the social conditions, the markets, and the scramble for money, food, and space. That's China, the crowded east, the deserted west. Chapter 9 Xi'an There are a thousand man-made underground rooms in the Buddhist caves in Dunhuang, and they are packed with extraordinary wall art, documents, carvings, and statues devoted to Buddha. Discovered by accident by a guy chasing a sheep into a hole, they had been sealed for 900 years until 1900, so they weren't ravaged like older finds. On my last trip through here, I had eaten at a restaurant owned by Mr. Xi. He treated me so well, I wanted to look him up again. We'd hit it off. Mr. Xi was a sunny 45-year-old with the Chinese air of agelessness. He was a man who knew his business because he had built it up from nothing. He had been a farmer who started out by selling food to the other farmers in a little breakfast shop. He expanded it into a full-fledged restaurant with an inn attached. He loved what he did, and despite the long hours, his workers liked working for him, where they could make more money than they could by working for the state. His place reminded me of an inn out of the American Old West or England 300 years ago. He had six rooms, four beds to each, basically cots. Toilets were down the hall. This was the standard Chinese hotel, and it was everywhere. We tended not to stay in hotels like it, preferring the newer, more comfortable friendship hotels, which catered to foreign travelers. I wanted to see how the economy had affected him, because here we were, a year on the other side of the Tiananmen Square troubles. Before, I had visited him in the crescendo of boom times, back when everyone had been buying everything they could, getting rid of their paper money, back before the government was forced to devalue the currency and tighten money. He remembered me and greeted me warmly, pleased I'd come back. Tabitha and I were the only foreigners who'd ever been in this place. We were welcome, exotic visitors, just as in the fifties back in Alabama we had regarded Chinese or Pakistani people as visitors from another planet. Seating us at a big table, he insisted that we eat as his guest. We were treated to a feast of chicken, goat, and wonderful cold noodles garnished with onions, garlic, scallions, and a host of vegetables that don't have English names because they aren't grown in English-speaking parts of the world. Here in the middle of the desert, he even managed to serve us fish. Since the Chinese didn't send meats and produce for any distance, this fish must have been raised locally, a tribute to Chinese ingenuity. Yes, he had noticed there had been a falling off in business a year or so before, but now things were picking up again. The economy was reviving. Like entrepreneurs the world over, Mr. Xi worked overtime, 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, at building up his restaurant and getting rich. To him, this was no burden, because he was having fun, as such people often do. He was living proof of what it took to make the real world work. Despite what Americans might think about what's happened to the Chinese since Tiananmen Square, 1,200 miles from Beijing, Mr. Xi, left alone by meddling central planners to build up his own business, appeared to be one of the world's happy men. As soon as we hit Guan, the historical dividing line between the deserted west and the crowded east, we had another accident. As she had for weeks, Tabitha led, maneuvering along the two-lane blacktop at 35 to 40 miles an hour. Both sides of the road were packed with people. It was maddening in China the way trucks, bicycles, pedestrians, everyone pulled into the street without looking. I was somewhat used to it, but not Tabitha. An old man on a bicycle swerved in front of her, and she was suddenly boxed in. She had to hit someone. There were so many people on both sides and this bicycle was in front of her. She slammed on her brakes and blew her horn, but the old guy was deaf or ignored her, because in China, the larger vehicle always has to move out of the way of the smaller. Having slowed but unable to stop, she hit him and his bike at five to ten miles an hour. A mob surrounded us. The police arrived. Tabitha was shattered and had a hard time talking. I took over. The old man didn't seem badly hurt, but he had fainted. 
Under local law, Tabitha was automatically the guilty party, even though I had seen that the accident wasn't her fault. The old man was carted off to the hospital. The crowd muttered and shot us nasty looks. Afraid we would become the center of another disturbance, the head policeman insisted we move on out of town. In the States, he might have taken us to the police station so he could find us when he wanted us, but he wasn't worried about losing us. Out here, we were rare birds. Two foreigners on foreign bikes, on the region's only road, were ridiculously easy to run down. Upset, we cranked up and headed out as he instructed, awaiting his report. The policeman caught up with us later at the westernmost end of the Great Wall, crumbling here in the desert. Well, you know, he said, we've really got to do something about this man and his family. Relieved that he wasn't arresting us, I said, Okay, how much? Two hundred dollars? Dollars? On the black market here in the wilds of China, two hundred dollars was the equivalent of a year's pay or more. Whenever I figure I'm being held up by an official, I ask for a receipt. Half the time it makes him back down because he doesn't know to whom I'm liable to show it. He starts to think, suppose he shows it to my boss and I've kept the money. But this policeman was happy to give me one. I forked over the money and asked him to convey our concern to the injured man's family. I would bet my net worth the poor old guy never saw a penny that the policeman kept the entire amount. I've still got that receipt, in Chinese, of course, scrawled on a ragged scrap of paper. For all I know, it says, stick it in your ear. Gas was a constant worry, as it was hundreds of miles between public pumps. We always drove with one eye on our odometer, calculating when we might be able to fill up again. On one occasion, our tanks were so low, and we were so far from a town, that we'd taken to coasting down inclines, striving to conserve every drop. We came across a fenced-in military outpost and drove up to the guardhouse. By using sign language, pointing at our gas tanks and pantomiming how empty they were, we persuaded the guards to escort us to a pump on the base. The attendant didn't have the authority to sell us gas, so we were bumped up to the base commandant. In his bare office we showed Commander Lu our passports, maps, and permission papers. He frowned. In our usual pigeon of the local language, basic English and sign language, with which we seemed to get along in any culture, we explained that we had run out of gas. Commander Lu was not only mystified that two western motorcyclists were in the middle of his country, but astonished that we had penetrated his military security. Finally, we told him he had to arrest us as spies or sell us some gas. Laughing, he instructed his people to give us gas, and nobody would take any money for it. A few hundred miles past Jaiguan, we were again close to running out of gas when we saw dozens of guys in hillside dugouts and shacks by the side of the road, with ten, fifteen, twenty liters of gasoline and plastic in tin containers. Once again, the black market had come to our rescue. We learned many things in going around the world, and one of them is you don't have to worry too much about running out of gas. In many places, the black market will figure out where travelers are likely to run out and be there to sell it to you. In this case, hundreds of miles between Chinese cities, these enterprising spirits had figured out how to get gas to the middle of nowhere and were delighted to sell it to us. We drove over the mountains, the highest pass at 10,500 feet, into Lanzhou, Beautiful scenery, sculpted terraces, with coal-burning locomotives chugging in the distance. We visited the local market. It had expanded since I'd last been there, with better quality produce but higher prices. As it was early in the season, and nobody trucked produce great distances in China, a small watermelon cost $2.70. I hunted up a tea house, never easy for a foreigner to find. Ask the Chinese or to find one, and you won't get a straight answer, as these places aren't approved of. I suppose if a Russian or Chinese visitor to Chicago in 1926 had asked to be guided to a speakeasy, he'd have had a hard time too. At the Culture Palace Tea House, rumpled old men dappled by the sunlight filtering through the thatched roof lounged around playing cards, dominoes, and mahjong 
A sign said that no drunkenness, no fighting, and no bad language were allowed. A painfully thin middle-aged male singer, backed by a three-piece string combo, wailed a lament of the cruelties of love and life while being ignored by the crowd. These sprawling ne'er-do-wells, wreathed in cigarette smoke, had a lethargic vegetative manner, laid back and contemplative, as if they had seen life outside the tea house and found it wanting. Glad to see us, they pushed tiny glasses of Mao Tai on us, which I couldn't get out of drinking. The Chinese speak of Mao Tai with reverence, the way Southerners smack their lips over bourbon or the Scots revere scotch. It's a highly potent liquor, made in Guizhou province from sorghum and wheat yeast, and aged five or six years, but it tastes so foul that nobody but the Chinese can stand to drink it. I begged off after one glass. From the waitress I bought a deck of Chinese cards as well as two jackets, made fashionable with embroidered English words that no one here realized were nonsense syllables. Even though the place housed a couple of drunks, I was struck by its serenity. It reminded me of men sitting around a store, barber shop, or pool hall back in Alabama, gossiping, drinking, gambling, having some place to go to get away from the women, just as many primitive tribes have a men's lodge for the same purpose. Here there were constant cups of tea, some beer, a drop of Mao Tai, a little gambling, and a lot of gossip and camaraderie. No sign said women not allowed, but you never saw women. This was a place my grandfather Brewer in Oklahoma would have appreciated. Late in the afternoon, my grandmother would go looking for him, and she'd storm into all the domino parlors. It just infuriated her. When she'd find him at last, she'd always say, Damn it, I told you not to play dominoes. Back then, Oklahoma was dry, but bottles and paper bags were behind the counter, snuck in by the bootleggers. And after all, Dutch Brewer was somebody in town. He not only owned its radio station, he also owned shares in the bank, had roomed in law school with the state's future senator, and had been one of the most sought-after young lawyers of his class. I guess he was supposed to be helping at home or doing something, anything productive, but like a lot of guys, he preferred to be with his cronies. The communists have been trying to shut down tea houses for 40 years, just as our government back in Prohibition tried and failed to shut down speakeasies. Throughout history, there have always been places for men to gather to do the things men like to do together. Places like this will always exist, no matter how politically incorrect. Men's clubs in England, men's lodges in African and Native American tribes, saloons out west, barber shops and pool halls in the south, and Chinese tea houses all have an apparent universal appeal. Naturally, we also constantly found places where only women gathered together. I noticed here in Lingzhou how the Chinese had polluted the air. No third-world country has pollution controls on its chimneys or smokestacks. However, the Chinese have done a better job on their rivers than most, probably because they need the fish, whereas the Russians, with fewer people to feed, have carelessly killed lots of their internal waterways. The Chinese drink only boiled water. When we checked into Chinese hotels, they gave us big, elaborate, wonderful thermoses filled with water that stayed hot for 24 to 48 hours to use for tea or washing. Typically Chinese. Why waste all that fuel heating water and piping it around when a few thermoses will do the trick? The drive from Langzhou to Ping Lang was spectacular. We climbed up to a 7,000-foot-high ridge and drove along the top. The Chinese had planted thousands of trees on top of this ridge to keep the winds from blowing everything away. All the way down on both sides were contoured terraces with saplings. Without warning, a dozen beekeepers and their hives appeared along both sides of the road, then hundreds of hives and scores of beekeepers. Worried about getting stung, we lowered our visors and pulled on our gloves, covering ourselves thoroughly. These were nomadic migrant beekeepers, we learned, with five to fifty hives each. Naturally, the worker bees went with the beekeepers to wherever they moved the queen bees. From spring to fall, the beekeepers followed the budding of flowers, spending a few days in a location till the bees had drunk all the area's nectar, then moved on. Thousands, 
Millions, billions of bees filled the air and buzzed everywhere. This extraordinary sight went on for fifteen miles, with hundreds of the beekeepers camped in tents along the side of the road, often with their families. The beekeepers, for the most part, wore no protection, living in perfect harmony with their bees. This was yet another example of superb Chinese productivity. They took the bees to the blooming flowers, rather than allow the bees access only to what spring chanced to bud around them. Of course, like the Chinese themselves, the bees had to work six to seven times harder than their foreign counterparts, as their masters had extended their honey-gathering season from a few weeks to half a year. We saw amazing sights in China, but little to match those miles of bees and migrant beekeepers. It's that kind of productivity, that kind of planning and industry, that convinces me the Chinese will do better than any other people in the next century. Xi'an was called the glorious capital of the world 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. It flourished before Rome and was very likely even richer. Long since fallen into decline, today Xi'an is a provincial capital, a common pattern. The success of a country, a culture, an enterprise, a people, particularly a very great success, also contains the seeds of its decline, possibly its destruction. It's one of the things the real world rubs your nose in as you move through it. The once glorious civilizations of the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Chinese, the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, to name only a few, all are ruins now. In a way, Xi'an was lucky. It had found a new lease on life through its past. For years, Beijing, site of the beginning of the Great Wall, had been the country's tourist center, but now Xi'an was suddenly its major attraction. Several thousand years ago, whenever an emperor of China died, he had been buried in an elaborate ritual with his entire court, his surviving wives, his children, courtiers, guards, cooks, everybody. Some prime minister had come along, knowing his fate, and had come up with an idea. Why not make statues of everybody, life-sized terracotta statues, bury them and not us? Somehow he'd sold the emperor on this, and so every single person in the court had been individually modeled and sculpted in terracotta. So far in Jian, 8,000 of these buried life-size statues, foot soldiers, chariots, horses, generals, weapons, had been found, entire armies facing every direction of the compass to ward off attacks on the dead emperor. I'd seen pictures of the statues, but the first time you actually lay eyes on them is like first seeing the Taj Mahal or the Grand Canyon. It just knocks you out. It takes a few minutes to adjust to the fact that the army and courts stretching in every direction are real, not a dream, that people actually molded so many statues and did it so long ago. And then, every few minutes it hits you again, and you're amazed once more. A few of these terracotta statues have been shown in museums around the world, but to really see them, to really feel their impact, you must go to Xi'an, to the underground museum. All this was discovered only in 1974, and they're still digging. God knows what they're going to find before it's all over. So far, they've dug up one emperor's court, who knows how many more there are. As usual, we stayed at the best hotel in town, which in many towns was a five-flea instead of a five-star, the Golden Flower. We met the manager, a single Englishman named John Brown, a 42-year-old career hotel manager whose Midlands accent seemed wildly out of place. He supervised the 500 Chinese employees mainly teenage girls, who staffed the hotel and catered to all the foreigners flying in to see the terracotta statues. The hotel had its own beauty school, which taught the girls how to dress, make themselves up, and serve, taught them everything from the ground up. To them, it was a glamorous job, like being an airline stewardess 35 years ago. It was here that we learned that the Chinese are taught it's dangerous to kiss a foreigner because the Chinese will get sick. Despite this, I must say I wondered about John's private life. Tourism here was booming so much that even professors were giving up their positions to work in hotels as room clerks. They didn't see it as a step down, but as a move up to money and glamour. <laughs>
The lure of a more prosperous life has changed people's direction throughout history. Here we saw a few beggars, but not as many in a week as you'd see in an hour in India. Some hung around restaurants waiting to move in on table scraps. They didn't seem to bother foreigners. I'd always heard there was a fabulous bird market in Jian. Frequently going through a town, we'd see 15 to 20 old guys sitting in the park, each with a bird cage. In the U.S., we take our dogs to the park. In China, you take your bird. A bird is the quintessential Chinese pet. It doesn't take up much room, nor does it eat much. In the same way, ping pong and shooting pool are the quintessential Chinese sports. Cricket and baseball and football won't ever be as popular. They take up too much space. Anyway, I wanted to see the bird market, but when I asked about it, I kept being told there was none. On two prior trips, I had failed to find it. After making a nuisance of myself at the Golden Flower and with a dozen cab drivers, I finally found a driver who would take us. He drove us to a tiny market about the size of an American living room with a dozen cats and a few dogs. These aren't popular as pets in China. They, too, take up too much room, and the communists discourage them as capitalist bourgeois. Knowing that governments rarely reveal their real reasons, I understood that they didn't want to have to feed millions of pets. So Tabitha and I did our sign language bit, going tweet-tweet and flapping our wings. After a couple more false stops, he finally let us out and pointed, indicating that we had to walk the rest of the way, that vehicles couldn't get any closer. He was right. The road was too crowded, a sea of humanity. But when we turned the corner, there it was, a quarter of a mile of birds. Thousands of cages on both sides of the street, spilling beyond the road's edge, on the ground, dangling from bicycles, hung in trees, and along ropes stretched between poles. Every kind of bird was displayed. Doves, parakeets, and ducks, parrots big and little, larks, canaries, swallows, thrushes, and titmice, exotic birds with brilliant headdresses, which we couldn't identify, hundreds of different kinds of birds not to speak of the odd chicken destined for the pot, as well as snakes and goldfish meant for pets. The area was packed with customers haggling with the sellers. As we were talking to a seller, a bird streaked over our heads, free of his cage, and headed for the hills. But the bird seller reached up and snatched it from the air with the nonchalance I would use to pick an apple. I couldn't decide who was more stunned, the bird or me. Twice more we saw bird keepers pluck flying birds from the air. We didn't know whether to move forward or backward, afraid we'd miss something. We gathered that a bird was an inexpensive purchase, on a par with a cat back home. The Jian bird market was like so much in China, intense, packed, crowded. Between the crush and our curiosity, it took us forever to walk through it. Since I've been back to the U.S., I've told friends... If you go to Xi'an, yes, see the terracotta warriors, but also be sure to see the bird market. Everyone has come back and said, there is no bird market. I don't know why nobody will take them there. Usually there's a reason why natives don't want travelers to see places like the bird market or the tea houses. Maybe the Chinese think Westerners will say rude things if they think some Chinese are layabouts and others eat parakeets. Well, it's true. The Chinese will eat any bird, so maybe that's what it is. Perhaps they think the bird market is somehow not politically correct. Chapter 10 Jian to Beijing We drove over the mountains to Luoyang, a day's drive of 500 miles. I had a flat on my rear tire, the second of what would be twenty or so between us over the entire trip. We both changed it, with me acting as Tabitha's assistant. With more than another thousand miles to Shanghai, we were now down to two spares, as with tubeless tires it's wise to discard them once they go flat, as per the manufacturer's instructions. Mostly we drove on two-lane blacktop. In a few places the road was a mess, worse than on my last trip although this time it wasn't washed away. Of course, there had been no sign saying, Beware, road washed out, detour, 
Imagine in the United States if a main road was out from New York to Boston. It would be all over the news. But the Chinese don't announce disasters. We were about to leave Luoyang for Shanghai, where we had reservations on the monthly ferry to Japan, when some damn bureaucrat attached to the travel office panicked and threatened to call out the army if we drove there. We pleaded and showed Mr. Zhu our papers, but he was a local fellow who refused to understand that we already had permission. I even tried to bribe him with my standard line. I know this is out of the ordinary. There must be an extra fee that can be paid. Mr. Zhu wouldn't bite, and it was clear we couldn't go to Shanghai. As this was only a year after Tiananmen Square, he probably decided foreigners could be better controlled in Beijing. This one functionary was screwing up our timing for the entire trip. By now, late May, we were on a tight schedule dictated by climate and ferry departures to and from Japan. We were desperate to avoid winter. Not just in Siberia, where winter began in September, only three months away, but also in South Africa and Australia and Argentina. We had only a 13-day window in Japan to catch the boat from Yokohama to Siberia. If we missed it, we'd have to wait an entire month for the next one. So we were forced to alter our plans and drive north to Beijing. This didn't mean traveling more miles, but we didn't know what we would do after we arrived how we would get to Japan. Of course, this was often how we arrived in countries. A trip like this had so many variables, so many imponderables, such a changeable timetable, and was extended over so many months that it was impossible to obtain visas and book ourselves on every ferry and airline in advance. By necessity, we had to make it up as we went along, discover our passage in the process of making our way. Hurried inquiries told us the Beijing ferry to Japan was in dry dock for the summer. My next hope was to fly to Tokyo on the Chinese state airline, but airlines were often stuffy about bikes, disliking the idea of gas and batteries in their cargo holds. After all, they reasoned, even empty gas tanks held explosive vapor, and battery acids might wreak God knew what havoc on an airplane. Unless bikes were factory new, Singapore Air refused to take them at all no matter how well crated or prepped. I was sure we'd have problems with the Chinese airline, but I didn't know whether they would be severe or mild. Because the mania of Mao's red guards was long over and wall posters were rare, the fresh black and white posters caught my attention. Their bold ideograms on stark white paper made them look official and important. Almost everywhere we stopped in China, within a few minutes a schoolteacher would appear to practice his English. As I collect political posters, and we were right under one of these fresh ones we'd seen so many of, I asked the thin schoolteacher with the nicotine-stained fingers about it. Mr. Lee looked around furtively and edged closer to speak in a low tone. The poster announced the pending execution of two criminals. What had they done, I asked. Brandishing long pig knives, said Mr. Lee, these men in their late twenties had broken into a widow's house and robbed and injured her. They had been caught, had been found guilty, and were sentenced to die. Why the posters, I asked. Would there be a public execution? No. How would it be done? With a pistol shot. Unless the robbers wanted a more brutal form of death, they or their families would buy the two bullets with which the police would execute them. The police assigned the task would drive them around until a suitable burial site was found, at which point the criminals would be given the task of digging their own graves. There would be no coffins. Once their graves were dug, the bullets they had purchased would make a swift end of them. In contrast to the bold black ideograms on the white paper was a red check in the poster's bottom right-hand corner. What's that for? I asked. It means the execution was carried out whispered my informant. Filled with unease, we pushed on. From Lanzhou on, we had begun to notice more people. Once we'd left Xi'an, once we'd crossed the mountains, we were right in it, smack in the fertile, populated part of China. From here to Beijing were constant masses of people. Everywhere, in the countryside, the cities, the towns, the villages, we were never out of sight of people. People. 
The roads were incredibly crowded because everybody and everything was out using them. Pigs, goats, people, bicycles, carts, trucks. The expression teeming Asian masses took on real meaning. Slow traffic stayed to the side, and the few vehicles drove right down the road's middle. When we were lucky, we made 30 to 40 miles an hour. Once along the road to Luoyang, we came on a huge traffic tie-up. I rode up to see what the problem was. A wagon was sitting in the middle of the road, blocking everybody. The driver had disconnected it and left it there, and had driven off with whatever was pulling that wagon to fetch a spare part. Whenever a vehicle broke down, the driver just went off and left it to get help. Nobody worried about his property being stolen. In this case, nobody got out of his car to move the damn wagon either. I mean, eight guys could have pushed it to the side of the road if they had thought about it. When I went back for Tabitha, I clocked it. The queue was three miles long. From time to time, we drove over a heap of grain in the road, put there to be threshed by traffic. We also rode across piles of nuts placed in the road to be cracked. We never saw any public displays of affection between the sexes. It must happen. People have been necking for thousands of years. We saw girls walking down the street holding hands with girls, boys with boys. Not homosexual, which is against the law. Just as friends, the way you see it in France or the Middle East. On my last trip, I had attended an outdoor dance, an afternoon disco. I noticed that the guys danced only with guys, the girls with other girls. Finally, this guy came over and asked me to dance, taking me aback. I had never been asked to dance by a guy before. I protested, but went in China. Still, I didn't particularly like it, and I wasn't very good at it. On the way to Xinjiang, a large industrial city that has sprung up over the past few decades, we stopped off at a big Buddhist temple with a martial arts school. In China today, there are many cities of three million and four million people, close to the size of Los Angeles, that forty years ago were no more than villages. If such growth happened in Kansas, it would be a much remarked event. Here in China, the story has been lost to the outside world. I noticed more gas stations than on previous trips, all state-run, of course, except for the black marketeers. Xie Zhuang, too, had one of the 80s boom-time hotels, but as usual, it was almost empty. Approaching Beijing was very exciting to both of us. A sign said Beijing, 49 kilometers, in western letters, no less. Just seeing road signs was a shock. This was part of the new internationalism. We were moving back into the other world, the one we'd left behind in Istanbul 7,000 miles ago. Tabitha and I grinned at each other. We'd crossed the Eurasian mass on bikes. 9,400 miles of driving, Ireland to Beijing, mostly over two-lane blacktop pocked with treacherous potholes, often no better than a bad southern dirt road, full of farm animals, ramshackle vehicles, and pedestrians careless about traffic. We'd done it in March, April, and May, and thankfully the weather hadn't been bad, only a few rainy days. We'd slept in five flea and five-star hotels, we'd eaten off the best china in luxury hotels, and fly-specked tin plates in outdoor bazaars. But we'd done it. At that moment, I knew if we could do this, we could do anything together. We hit the four-lane blacktop into Beijing, quite a luxury. We could now roar along at 60 or 70 miles an hour, unfettered. We passed through Tiananmen Square, the heart of Beijing, a vast sea of cobblestones. In the old days, this had been the location of government offices, but Mao had changed its character. Wearing his Red Guard armband, he had reviewed parades of a million people here. In 1976, this had been the place where another million people had paid him their last respects. On my 1988 visit, the huge square had been a lazy place to fly one of those fancy Chinese kites or to sprawl around on a summer evening, a combination of Moscow's Red Square and New York's City Hall Park. History was on all sides of us here. Tiananmen Gate to the Forbidden City, the History Museum and the Museum of the Revolution, the Great Hall of the People, Chan Men Gate, 
the Mal Mausoleum, and the Monument to the People's Heroes. If you got out early in the morning, you could watch a troop of PLA soldiers raise the flag in a precisely drilled ceremony of 108 paces to the minute. But now, almost a year since Tiananmen Square, scores of police were everywhere, afraid of another demonstration on the anniversary of the first, not letting Westerners tarry. Under their suspicious eyes, we took a few pictures and moved on. With our plan to take the ferry from Shanghai thwarted by the army, I was in a sweat to make the jump to Japan. We had to stay inside the bubble of summer as we moved around the globe. After checking into our hotel, we did a bit of sightseeing, taking in the forbidden city. While it would have been nice to see more of Beijing, the next day we rushed out to Beijing International Airport to see about getting ourselves and the bikes to Tokyo. Although the passenger terminal was bustling, the freight terminal might have been in a sleepy southern town for all its inactivity. There was no traffic and not a lot of international trade, which I guessed went through the ports. Nothing was so urgent that it had to be rushed to China. That country hadn't had it for centuries, so why hurry now? There is no guidebook that tells motorcyclists how to get from Istanbul to Beijing, much less from Beijing to Tokyo. I was dreading this, knowing what we had gone through to ship the bikes from New York to Shannon. Not only would we have to crate the bikes, but we would have to disconnect the batteries, drain the gas, and fill out God knew how many forms and deal with countless functionaries, each one impressed with the importance of his office or fearful of losing his job by allowing us to do what we wanted. On May 29th we took the bikes to the airport, and we spent the whole day there although we were the only people shipping out freight. We always allowed ourselves a full day to cross a border, and this time, in fact, it did take ten full hours to make the arrangements. The insurance office, the authorization office, the airline office, and naturally several cashier's offices. We had to have the bikes weighed. To my astonishment, nobody asked for a bribe or made any noises about draining the gas and disconnecting the batteries. Actually, being the first motorcyclist to leave the Beijing airport for Japan worked in our favor. Had we been the tenth or the hundredth, they would have worked out a procedure that would have taken days instead of hours, but we took them by surprise. I knew, too, from years of travel that once you start the process of crossing a border, you have to carry it through with all the speed you can muster. Don't ever stop. Don't ever say, I'll come back tomorrow or even in an hour. Keep it moving, or it will never get done. While it might seem nice to lollygag your way around the world, it takes a kind of intensity to make a trip like this. Giving in to the desire to take it easy or to go off to sightsee, or allowing yourself to become discouraged by some bureaucrat's red tape during a border crossing, of which we would have more than a hundred, would probably mean not completing a trip as long as this, or that it would be extended by years. Luckily, working your way across a border takes on a life of its own, and the last thing you want to do is to cripple that movement. One guy says, Okay, now go see Joe. Or he shouts over, Joe, take care of these guys, they're okay. If you stop the process, it always runs into a snag. Any pause gives the clerks a chance to think, and what bureaucrats do when they stop to think is figure out a reason why you can't do what you want to do. Pausing is dangerous even after you have crossed a border. For God's sake, don't linger a few paces on the other side while the border guard mulls over what he's just done, what his boss is going to say when he gets back from lunch. You want to get the hell out of there, move on while the moving on is good. So, once we had made inquiries and the bureaucrats had committed themselves, the last thing we wanted to do was slow down the process of exiting by suspending it for a week to sightsee in town. I promise you, the next week that process would have been different, longer, more cumbersome, and maybe impossible. So we announced we were ready to leave on the weekly plane the next day, which helped push along the endless paperwork. Worried that the job wouldn't be done right, we went with the bikes to see them strapped to pallets. Because that day no other freight was going to Tokyo, every freight handler at the airport showed up to attack this problem. Twelve husky Chinese handlers strapped this way and that, but nothing ever worked. 
once they tied Tabitha's bike so tight that the metal pallet came up, buckled. So finally Tabitha climbed on the pallet and said, All right, guys, let me show you how to do this. All these freight handlers stood back and watched this tall, long-haired blonde woman strap the bikes down, which they had tried to do for two hours and failed. When she finished, a little cheer went up, led as much by me as by anyone. Tabitha wanted to see as much of the sights as we could squeeze in, so we taxied into town for the night. In many ways, Beijing is the stuffiest place in China, and not at all characteristic of the country. While it has the best of everything, the best hotels, the best food, the best roads and streets, it's a city of straight-laced museums and pompous functionaries. Everywhere you turn, there's a gray wall with a closed gate or door. The city's influence, however, is felt throughout China. Across all of China's 3,000 miles, even as far away as Urumqi, unbelievable as it may seem, the clocks are set on Beijing time. Thus, we'd wake up at 7.30 in the morning in the west, and it was still dark, because in this geographic time zone, it was really 4.30. The capital's bureaucrats pushed their directives onto the far-flung countryside. But where for years they were obeyed, more and more they are not only resisted, but ignored, especially in the south around Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Shanghai, where the capitalist spirit is raging like a wildfire. Tabitha wanted to go to the Summer Palace, but we were told it was closed for repairs. We found out later there had been a big incident there. The authorities had beaten someone to death. For my part, I was disappointed that we didn't have time to revisit either of the two main southern provinces, Fujian, right across from Taiwan, and Guangdong, which surrounds Hong Kong. Both interest me enormously because both have been strongly influenced by Taiwan's and Hong Kong's capitalistic prosperity, by their free market, entrepreneurial fervor. Guangdong and Fujian are themselves major centers of capitalism, of entrepreneurship, of foreign investment. Most of the people who had fled to Taiwan came from Fujian province, for an obvious reason. It was right across the sea. Many of our own Chinese immigrants of the 19th and 20th centuries came from those two provinces because they were near the ports, the easy way out. Plus, down there they get Hong Kong TV. Dallas is a powerful motivator throughout the world. People everywhere want to be rich. These southern provinces have listened less and less to Beijing. The capital thinks it still controls the army, but it's beginning to have its doubts. When the Tiananmen Square troubles were at their height, Beijing considered bringing in the Cracker Jack army from Guangzhou to deal with the problem. Then it realized these guys probably wouldn't come. The southern army was intertwined with the capitalists and entrepreneurs down there, getting their share of the new profits, and they weren't going to waste their time putting down a bunch of kids in a square. The Communist Party hasn't fallen in the eyes of the Chinese. Yet. The Chinese down in the south and in the countryside still call themselves communists, even though they are as capitalist as they can be. The bureaucrats, the military, the generals... They are all in there, trying to grab their piece of the action. It's clear that over the most recent centuries, China has been pretty corrupt, although we might not always agree on what that means. Once China was the richest, most powerful country in the world, but it's been in decline for a long, long time. Even in the 18th century, China was still wealthy. The last sovereign, the Empress Dowager, wasn't corrupt so much as without dynamic, without the vision and enterprise needed to keep up with the world and the place of the Chinese in it. The ruling classes still sat around doing the Mandarin things they'd been doing for the past 500 years, totally isolated from the rest of the world. Over a nearly 40-year period, from before the First World War until after the Second, China's empire was in turmoil and decline, just as the Soviet Union has been. What happened during that large empire's collapse is a model for what's likely to happen in the former Soviet Union, 30 to 40 years of civil wars waged by warlords, i.e. military leaders exercising power over civilians by force. The collapse in the Soviet Union will be far more complicated, however, as China was more compact, with a billion people of a single ethnic group 
the Han are 94% of the population and live mainly in the east, crowded into a space the size of the United States east of the Mississippi. The USSR not only sprawls across two continents, but is composed of more than a hundred different religious, language, ethnic, and national groups. The nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek and his lads, got rid of all that Mandarin decay, but they were replaced by communists, who were even more corrosive to the native Chinese soul. Mao Zedong and his communist cadres won the Chinese Revolution and kept the Americans out of North Korea, but they lived as privileged elites and did not cleanse China's spiritual rot. Mao, who himself had begun his career as a warlord, was an extraordinary revolutionary and strategist who mobilized his guerrillas to wage an effective civil war. However, like other successful revolutionaries such as Castro, Lenin, Stalin, Cromwell, Bolivar, and Ghana's Nkrumah, after the revolution succeeded, Mao didn't have the sharply different set of skills and understanding needed to run a country and an economy. His post-revolutionary Great Leap Forward, agricultural and industrial policies, and cultural revolution were all disasters. Even thirty years later, the mainland communists haven't undone the damage of Mao's cultural revolution. In addition to the devastating economic and social disruptions of that period, throughout China many monuments and historic sites were destroyed. They haven't been and probably never will be rebuilt. Mao and his gang were lucky the Chinese infrastructure takes so little to operate, otherwise the country would have collapsed like some of the African countries after they'd used up what wealth the colonialists left. All the roads the Chinese seem to need are those for bicycles and pedestrians. The phones and railroads seem to work better than those in the Soviet Union and Africa, maybe because, relatively speaking, China is a more compact country. What could happen is that China will split into three countries, the North, the South, and the West. The people from the South in Guangdong speak a different language from the people in Beijing, Cantonese versus Mandarin, as well as being in their hearts entrepreneurial and not communist. Then there's the West, the desert, filled with Muslims, an area which no Chinese back East particularly wants, but which might be valuable as a buffer against the forces from the West and might contain fabulous minerals, oil, gold, copper, or diamonds. As a buffer, it struck me as an expensive anachronism. Sure, Genghis Khan or Tamerlane would have had to march across the desert to reach Beijing, but a modern army would fly over. The western region may split off from China, not because of any ideological independence movement, but because the region is still culturally, geographically, and spiritually part of the old Turkestan. As recently as the 1960s, there was armed resistance to Beijing in the West, although considering to whose tender mercy such independence would have laid them vulnerable, the Russians, I can't say the region's leaders had thought through their rebellion. The mentality throughout the South and in the countryside in the North is different from that of the capital, and on my three prior trips, two of them close to the ground motorcycle visits in 1986 and 1988, I had found its spirit being fed more and more. To give you a sense of the economic entity coming into being, by the end of this decade China's economy will be the third largest in the world, although obviously this won't be on a per capita basis. Sometime in the first half of the 21st century, China will come to have the world's largest economy. What will be the effect of China's one-child-per-couple policy on its future? After all, people in agricultural countries like China always have wanted lots of kids to help on the farm and as an insurance policy for their old age. In all of history, such an unnatural policy has never been tried. I ask myself if these only children will be so spoiled and self-centered as to shift the Chinese personality. Then, too, many studies document the success orientation of only and first-born children. Will an entire nation of them strive even harder than today's hard-working Chinese? China could wind up as a nation of spoiled, driven achievers. Then I ask myself if parents and grandparents in such a country will send their only darlings to die in a war. What I do know for sure is that the Chinese have a long history of trading, as far back as Roman times, 
It's a collective memory, a historic set of skills and attitudes. In the 21st century, China is going to be the most capitalistic, most developed, and richest nation in the world. Forget Japan. Our children should be learning Chinese. Here are more than a billion people being infected with the Taiwan miracle. Hong Kong is the site in the larger body where the growth has taken root, and its shoots are rapidly spreading northward. Sooner or later, the southern provinces will influence those northward, and this fast-growing bamboo capitalism will spread across all of populous eastern China. We forget, too, the overseas Chinese. No one knows how many there are, but they are in every country. Taiwan, Thailand, Singapore, San Francisco and New York, Australia. Many thriving, many rich. A third of the population of Malaysia is Chinese. They've been emigrating from China's southern provinces for more than a century, but especially since the communists came, unwilling to be ground under the heels of self-righteous thugs. Even if you're third-generation Chinese, a cheerleader living in Beverly Hills who doesn't know a chopstick from a baton and who has never heard a word of Cantonese, you're still Chinese to the Chinese. You're welcome back any time, and they're happy to give you a passport. Many of the overseas Chinese have expertise and capital and want to go back and help, or invest in China and make lots of money. The Chinese welcome them with open arms. There may be 50 to 100 million overseas Chinese, 7 to 20 times the population of Hong Kong, vast numbers around the world with vast wealth. China goes so far as to set up three classes of hotels, one for the locals, one for foreign travelers, and one for the overseas Chinese. Compare them with the overseas Russians. The Russians don't have a vast, successful overseas population to aid their stricken country. Why? First, there are not huge numbers of them overseas. Second, the overseas Russians haven't been as successful as the overseas Chinese. Third, they don't have the Chinese historical capitalistic experience. The Russians weren't great capitalists even under the Tsars, whom the communists threw out 75 years ago. The communist takeover in China was only in 1949. Lots of Chinese alive today still remember capitalism. Fourth, few overseas Russians want to go back home, whereas the Chinese do. The Russians who left have been absorbed by other cultures. Few Russians in Brooklyn think of returning to Russia. They want to move to a fancy suburb. What Russia has in abundance are ethnic groups wanting to govern themselves. All that's going to lead to is chaos. If China disintegrates, it's going to be into three countries, the three reasonably coherent, rational parts I mentioned previously. Russia will disintegrate into, say, 50 or 100 belligerent factions. Will this be dangerous to us or even to Europe? No, because these factions will be too small to be of military importance, but more important, they have fought one another for hundreds of years, and what working weapons, including nuclear bombs, they have, they will at worst use on one another. Still, I'd be tempted to sell short almost any non-Chinese company with a massive investment in China, because the Chinese frame of reference won't allow outsiders to make the big money. Why? There is a centuries-old suspicion and contempt for foreigners first bred by the Middle Kingdom's certainty that it was the center of the universe. The rock-hard belief that persists until today that the Chinese way of doing things is best isn't going to be shaken any time soon by the West. Thus, because they're treated differently, the Americans, the Germans, and even the Japanese aren't going to make nearly as much money in China as the local and overseas Chinese will. Anyone else who invests in China, as the Japanese are doing, needs a strong stomach for risk and the patience to wait maybe 20 years for a proper return. The folks who do that probably will get rich, of course, because the market is so huge. How, then, should a prudent Western investor play the Chinese economic explosion? If you want to get involved, you should get a Chinese company to do business for you in China. For example, if XYZ Corporation announced it was going to make a major effort to market directly in China, I'd be tempted to short it. But if instead it hooked up with an overseas Chinese health and beauty company already marketing successfully in China, perhaps one listed on the Thai or Singapore stock exchanges, 
I might be an eager buyer of XYZ Corporation or the overseas Chinese company itself. At the airport the next morning, we worried that the bikes hadn't made it onto the plane. We asked if we could see them in the cargo hold. Sure, no problem. I imagined what I would have gone through at Kennedy Airport to peer into a cargo hold. It would have taken 17 bureaucrats 17 hours to deal with such a simple request. There the bikes were, tucked away, just as Tabitha had left them. We took off, leaving China, the country with the most people, and heading for Japan, the country with the most money.